Yeah. It's like shiny things. <laughs> okay, well, we have uh, a quorum, so um, we'll call the meeting to order. And again, um, remind members that the uh, phones should be um, switched off so that they don't interfere with the system. And to remind you that the meeting will be on camera today. Right, okay. um, could I also remind members that uh, we have an obligation to carry any relevant financial or other interests in relation to today's business and ensure that the volume in all tablet devices is off, function and F8. Um, as regards apologies, um, the clerk has received apologies from Leslie Cree, from Karen McEvitt. Um, and William Humphrey is at a funeral and will be late. But hopes to be here later on. Are members aware of any other apologies? No. Um, we have the draft minutes of the meetings on the 25th of September and also the 20th, 29th of September. Uh, they're at pages 5 and 9. Um, and would members agree that the minutes are an accurate record of the meetings? Great. Great. Thank you. Well, our first main item on the uh, agenda today is the um, presentation by the Minister and her officials. We'll bring them in now. Members will be aware of the um, note there, the memo at page 13 and the business plan there itself at page 16. So can I welcome the uh, Minister and uh, officials to the committee this morning. Uh, we have Peter May, the Interim Permanent Secretary, and Arthur Scott, the Director of Culture. So if you want to proceed with your May presentation, okay. please. Thank you, Chair, and good morning. Um, and again, thank you for the opportunity to brief the committee today on departmental business plans for 1415, including the departmental priorities and progress against these priorities. Um, before I focus on the business plan, what it aims to achieve over the, next, the course of the year, it would be, with your indulgence, uh, useful to step back a bit and reflect and indeed take pride on what has already been achieved. Um, when you consider the size of DECAL in terms of budget and numbers of staff, uh, I believe it has contributed well in excess of what it would be rationally expected to do. As the members will be more than aware, the City of Culture was a major success, not just for the city itself, but indeed for the wider North Northwest area. And we're not done yet. It has provided an opportunity for the city to showcase itself on an international stage and prove that it can be a significant creative and cultural hub for many years to come. DECAL now have a presence in, in Derry to harness opportunities and maximise the benefits resulting for the city of culture, again, not just the city, but indeed for the North West. Ravenhill, now called the Kingspan Stadium, was officially opened. It was a magnificent, world-class stadium. Sorry, it is. <laughs> and provides a fitting home for Ulster Rugby. Work is progressing on other stadiums, uh, including Casement Park and Windsor Park, and I am confident that they remain on track for completion of construction by 2016. But underpinning the stadium contracts, as well as the major areas of expenditure for department, is a desire to ensure that public spending provides as much benefit to the wider community as possible. Social clauses have been included in various contracts to ensure, for example, the employment of the long-term unemployed and the creation of apprenticeships and student placements. 46 projects have so far been supported this year through the Creative Industries Innovation Fund, resulting in a total of 197 projects being supported by this fund. LIFA continues to grow from strength to strength, with over 700, sorry, 7,500 people now committed to become fluent in Irish. It recently celebrated its third birthday, and I'm delighted that such a large number of people recognise the richness and vibrancy of the Irish language. Over the last three years, the Ministerial Advisory Group on the Ulster Scots Academy has committed financial support to over two million, uh, sorry, of over two million to almost seventy projects, such as, such as the Ulster Scots Education Project and a range of heritage tourism projects. 
Over the last year, the Department has continued its commitment to actively promote equality and tackle poverty and social exclusion through the delivery of culture, arts and leisure. This clearly links to the Executive's programme for government vision, which, amongst other things, seeks to address inequality and reduce poverty and disadvantage. A number of roadshows were held across the North earlier this year to provide high-profile platform to promote the services of DECAL and CLBs in tackling social and economic challenges. This has encouraged a number of groups to engage with the, with the DECAL family, and it is hoped that further roadshows will be rolled out later this year. The message on poverty and social exclusion has been fully embedded in the Department and its ALBs, and even greater efforts have been made in targeting our resources towards areas that are experiencing inequalities and suffering from greatest needs. As an example, Sport and I, through its Active 8 programmes, has targeted schools in areas of greatest need to encourage children to, to participate in physical activity. Libraries and I, through the Health and Mind programme, has promoted positive mental health through reading and learning. Museums have provided free admission for 5,000 households in hard to reach areas. The Ulster Council of the GAA recruited 11 long term Sorry, sorry, UGCAA has recruited 11 long-term unemployed people to deliver an eight-week programme which is involved in gaining qualifications and coaching opportunities. Under the Executive's Together Built and United Community TBUC initiative, DECAL is responsible for delivering a cross-community sports programme, which is one of seven headline actions contained within TBUC. Work is progressing on the implementation of this programme and funding has been secured to run a pilot programme. Um, all of this activity demonstrates the major role which my department plays, not only within society, but in helping progress the work of the executive and helping to fulfil its commitments. In addition to progressing our programme for government commitments, our promoting equality, tackling poverty and social exclusion, exclusion, our business plan contains a focus on making culture, arts and leisure more accessible, promoting and supporting our cultural identity and lifelong learning and excellence in service delivery. While I am conscious of the potential impact and budget reductions can have on programmes and staffing services, I will continue to ensure the funding is matched to the departmental priorities and my officials and I will work closely with stakeholders. I am mindful of the present challenges, but we can be proud of what has been achieved thus far. In my opinion, DECAL has enriched our cultural and sporting landscape and has had a positive impact on people from all communities, ages and backgrounds. I'd be happy to take questions. I'm sure the Chair will realise I cut a lot of that short, because I'm sure he'd much prefer to spend time on asking questions and getting answers. Okay, well, thank you thank very you. much, um, Carol. The um, first question I was going to ask was, um, obviously the big pressure on you is the, the one of finance. Yeah. And I was just wondering, does the department have an overarching strategy to deal with the, the cuts that you're faced with in terms of how you prioritise things? I actually, well, thank you for the question. And I'm, I, I do have an overarching strategy in terms of, as a, as a sorry, as a chair will know, nearly says as a minister will know, as a chair will know that even from his previous life, um, it's particularly even given the financial situation that we're all currently facing, but even um, just going through monitoring round processes, it really is important to make sure that we do prioritise uh, certain aspects of work within the DECAL family to bring it forward. And particularly given that in the past, small amounts of money have made a huge impact. Um, as a member and, and the members of the committee will know that uh, we are having an exciting meeting today, but even from previous meetings and even yesterday, okay. I think the executive is trying to take a candy attitude and a collective approach to looking at our financial situation. But for my end, it's really important that we look at certainly groups and areas of work within the DECAL family that have, in recent times, received small amounts of money, but actually have had a big impact, and it's important and will have a long-term impact. So it's not short-term, some of it's not even medium, but will have a longer-term impact, and it's really important that we look at that with a view of trying to protect it as best possible. And that has been cascaded to the ALBs as well. 
and I can understand, appreciate the point of, of yeah. having that issue that if you're swallowing money makes a difference, yeah, you're sure. getting value for money. But is there a sort of overarching um, strategy set of criteria that will be applied in terms of prioritisation? Well, I mean, I mean, the, yeah, yeah. I mean when, when you're looking at the in-year position, it's obviously very hard to make in-year cuts on a strategic basis because you end, up having, you end up making the savings in the areas where it's easiest to make the savings. Um, and at the moment, as you know, there is no clarity about the final level of uh, cut that is to be applied. The executive hasn't yet reached a, a consensus on that. But we are doing work looking ahead to 15-16 uh, uh, to try to understand um, you know, what plans uh, our arms length bodies uh, would have in the, in the event of various scenarios. So we are looking at, at a scenario-based approach. And on the basis of that, we'll then um, be putting something to the minister to enable her to, to take decisions about how best to move that forward. But the key thing is that we will start with our programme for government commitments. We will then have the Minister has set out very clearly her priority around promoting equality, tackling poverty and social exclusion. That's a priority that applies to the Department and all its arm's length bodies. And those are the areas that we will look to prioritise as we go forward. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Gordon Dunn. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Minister, and your officials for coming today. In relation to the arm's length bodies, which I understand will be subject to cuts, how can you ensure that the same level of cuts are applied across all of the bodies? Um, well, as I had said at the offset, and Peter again repeated the percentage uh, that we're expecting the ALBs, the cut still hasn't been decided upon. But the ALBs are very, very clear about honouring not just the programme for government commitments, but certainly the priorities are in making sure that inclusion, as best possible, is realised. Uh, I don't believe uh, it's fair that, uh, I mean, DECAL as a member is aware as the smallest uh, department in the executive. So 5% uh, or 1% or whatever percent cut to my department uh, has a bigger reach and impact than what it would to a bigger spent department. However, the ALBs, some of which receive more money than others, um, certainly have been in the business of prioritising what work they think well, not they think they know has a greater impact, uh, and on the basis of that, and on the basis of the fact that I trust the judgment and the, the, the propositions that they will bring forward, on the basis of not only honouring the programme for commitment, but making sure that they honour the commitments that they have made about the business that they need to do. So uh, it isn't a case of a plan cuts across the board to all the ALBs on, in the same fashion. Certainly, they know they have to make efficiency. Certainly, they know, and the members are aware that we're in very, very serious and challenging times. Uh, and I have a good working relationship with all the ALBs, and I'm looking forward to seeing what to bring forward. But already, we've started that process. In fact, the members will be aware that 15, 16 is zero base. So, in preparation for that, they had to bring forward key areas of work that they knew needed to be funded. So that process had already begun on decal well before we were in this financial situation, before this financial situation became more acute. So um, we're, we, we just wait on the outcome of decisions around finances. Um, and What about your, your own priorities as Minister? Will they influence how the, the cuts will be subjected? Well, we need to make sure people here for this removes and services aren't greater impacted. So, for example, um, I mean, I know you have libraries in later, but even other yeah. LBs around sports and arts. Uh, I mean, there's a lot in the media at the minute around, you know, cuts to arts funding, which is really events funding. But even just in terms of sports, it has proven that when we spend small amounts of money, particularly in working class areas, uh, on providing social inclusion opportunities, in the main for, for young men, but not exclusively, and it shouldn't be exclusively for young men, it has proved to go an awful long way, and it actually has helped to lever on other bits of money from other departments and other bodies and agencies. And I will endeavour to work with the ALBs that examples like that are visible in the, uh, the proposals that they bring forward. Would the lack of sports, libraries and... Sorry. 
Just <laughs> I congratulate <laughs> you on your ability to, to break the rule, and it was one question each, and we're nice. Is that it? <laughs> but you get a chance maybe later on if, if we open Thanks, Chair. Thank Thanks, you. Minister. For those Thank who were you. just a little bit here, we were trying to keep it to one question. This is a terrible so we get round and then we'll go round All right. the second okay. time. <laughs> um, so the next one, Dominic Bradley. Thanks. Nice. Why do you want to say? Gromaigadas and Coralahar Rintu. Thank you very much, Minister, for the presentation. Um, could I ask you about the um, languages uh, strategies? I see in the document that you, you have the commitment to the draft Irish Language Act. Yes. And the bringing forward of the two strategies, the Irish language and the Ulster Scott strategy. Yeah. Um, you know, given the uh, current financial situation, will there be actual resources to enact the strategies? Well, <coughs> yeah, thank you very much for the question, um, Ayamnik. It's really important that I often, and I, I know this is going to sound offensive, but I won't apologise for it either. I think when, certainly we're in strange and financial times, there has been a tendency to look at some functions within the call the scene as the easiest option. That language and arts and culture and sports and museums and libraries and all the rest aren't, in my opinion, and languages shouldn't uh, be subject to people seeing it as something you do in your spare time. It's a right rather than a luxury. I am aware that uh, all the other departments are certainly conscious of commitments that they're bringing forward. However, the Irish language and Ulster Scots culture and heritage language strategies uh, are currently uh, finalising the translation on both at the minute. They've already been around the executive colleagues. Uh, we'll go back again, uh, and I'll certainly be a strong advocate to ensure the funding for those uh, strategies are realised, uh, because there has been so much expectation built up within the communities. Uh, people have, in fact, I think the feedback to the consultations has been very good. I think it's been very realistic. Uh, it's not just people feeding in because they think it's what a certain political party wants them to say. It's actually based on their experience on the ground. And it would be a great sh shame and a great pity if people obligated their duty, because I believe it is a duty, to uh, fulfil their commitments to the, the language strategies. OK. OK, thank you. Um, Kathleen, Chair. Uh, uh, I was going to the Shah, I was going to go 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 to the Shah, I was going can I, can I just ask, uh, there's been a lot of speculation in the last week, particularly about funding around events and cultural events and, and what have you, and uh, there is quite a bit of fear out there, and uh, I know particularly in my own neck, I was in the North West there, there there's, there's some of the, uh, nearly all of the, of the great events that are have taken place up there on a yearly basis are, are in some way being threatened or rumoured to be threatened. I'm just wondering what stage are your discussions, or the department's discussions, with the likes of DETI, NITB, Invest NI and others uh, in terms of that? Uh, well, thank you, Member, for his kind words on this question. Um, I mean, I, f I found out about the funding for uh, from tourism to events, found out about the situation on the news, which was regrettable. Um, I was in the city of Derry on Saturday, actually passed a rally where I was actually getting blamed on the on the on the cuts, <laughs> which was <laughs> news to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but but I think the question has been asked, and I'm not the position to uh, I'm not in the position to answer it. A uh, funding for events does seem to be threatened, if not withdrawn, and it seems to be for smaller events, smaller cultural events which come back to questions that have been asked, have a big impact, and I think that's totally regrettable. I was asked questions on Monday by members about this. Uh, I heard what the Deputy Minister had to say. She says she regrets this. However, the question still remains in terms of some of the bigger cultural events, bigger sporting events. I'm not too sure what the position is with those, but it would be a great shame if, for example, big sporting events are protected and small cultural ones aren't. Uh, so I want to have that on the record. Uh, we do anticipate once the October monitoring round has been completed and concluded, uh, I would uh, encourage and will encourage discussions with uh, Minister Foster and myself about what 
steps we take and where we go next. And I've no doubt officials will be doing something. Okay, thank you. Um, Rosie McCorney. Um, I got a I was going to Ira. I was, and I think yes, Jack and Shaw, Lesh and Carl, and Shaw, Yemi. Um, thanks, Chair, and thank you, Minister, for coming here and your officials to give us presentations this morning. Um, following on from Dominic's question, Carl, uh, the the Irish language, um, as you know, I mean, it's it's a very vibrant, growing um, sector. Um, but it has suffered greatly from underinvestment sort of over, over decades. Um, and it also suffers from the failure of, of others to um, fulfil their commitments under, um, say, for instance, various Good Friday Agreements and Andrews, Hillsborough, and particularly, though, the um, European Charter for um, Regional Minority Languages. Um, Given that context, and, and we actually spoke yesterday to Lord Hall about the BBC's lack of commitment towards the language, particularly whenever you examine the investment in uh, Scots Gaelic and Welsh, and the, the investment in Irish is, is minimal, and it, it's you know it's very stark. And he acknowledged that. So, what what where then do you see um, your power and your commitment? to then doing what you can do, and I, I refer like to LIFA and to the support for the Giltock Quarter. How, how important then is that? Uh, well, it's, th thank you, Member, for a question. Uh, I think it is very important that, uh, I mean, and poses, you're right, it is in response to the answer I give to, to Dominic, that people don't see languages as the easy option, and unfortunately it has been the case, particularly given that, uh, uh, well, although you didn't ask it, but I will refer to it, um, you know, because I was asked about it again on Monday, uh, just in terms of you know, government's commitments to uh, international agreements need to be honoured. Um, that's the first thing. But certainly, um, I am conscious of the fact that even just from my experience of LIFA, <coughs> which is across community, through the community, around the community, part of the community, as you'll get. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm working with and meeting people from our constituency, well, uh, including your own, the, the Shankill and North Belfast and East Belfast as well, uh, who, who are involved in LIFA and, you know, and that's the way it should be. And it, it's good to see. Uh, the issue is that uh, I have and will do intend to speak to the current uh, members of the British government, have met with um, uh, Minister Vasey on extension broadcasting funds as an example, and have spoke about the fact that when it comes to the Irish language and the Ulster Scots broadcast funds, there needs to be a longer sustainability around those. Uh, as well as that, there are training and employment opportunities for the local television and production sector within those two, uh, within the, the broadcast funds as an example. But the BBC, in my opinion, uh, still have some way to go. So uh, I had also too had a positive meeting with Lord Hall yesterday. and. Uh, I, I can see that we're working with someone who gets what we're trying to do here. I also see, in terms of Gale Talk Quarter, the vibrancy within, because it, while it's based in West Belfast, it isn't a West Belfast project. It is certainly an example. There's no other place like it in this island. Uh, and see that the potential for lifelong learning, education, and employment uh, is thriving within, within the, the quarter, and certainly. Um, looking at hubs uh, across the north, both for the Irish language and indeed for Ulster Scots. And again, it all depends on money. But will I certainly be a strong advocate and a champion? I absolutely will. And I'm determined, where possible, uh, to ensure that um, people who have, have not received the investment they were entitled to aren't further disadvantaged by our current financial situation. <coughs> okay, thank you. Um, Oliver Mivold. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, Minister, for your presentation. Minister, I'm sure you'd agree that um, there are major sporting events here, like, for example, the forthcoming Golf Open. It's vital to not only to our economy, but uh, they are uh, a selling um, item for us as far as tourism and, uh, and, and the people from outside to encourage more people to come in here. So what, would you agree with me it is vital that we keep these going uh, and encourage them? And, and be more involved in them? Certainly. Um, I mean, people are using golf, the golf open, golf opens as an example of 
I suppose as an example to make a point, you know, for example, the, the money that's gone into the, the Gulf Opens and has well done previously certainly has highlight what we do well here in terms of providing a world class stage and world class opportunities around sport and culture. Um, and but also even, you know, the, the North West two hundred, the Cookstown one hundred, you know, you can name a few of the sporting events, workplace and fire games is zero. Uh, the Olympic and Paralympic Games, torch relays, where there was certainly uh, a big Im impact on our, what our tourism product is. We need to ensure that that's built upon uh, and increased because uh, even on the radio this morning I heard that, and I was at Culture Night in Belfast City and it was a brilliant success. But local traders uh, within that vicinity and within the city centre of Belfast, just as an example, the amount of money that was spent in one night, one of the contributors this morning said that you know their father's business would have received that over a week and a half. So even from a local economy point of view, we need to ensure that events, should they be big, medium or small, we need to try and protect those as best possible. Because not only do they help tourism, but they actually help a struggling small business sector as well. I also think that in terms of aspiration and inspiration, when we have big events on, they do inspire budding sporting athletes and young people and people who aren't so young to become involved and become active. And we, when we, you know, have opportunities missed, it's really, really difficult to try and reinstate and recaptivate that oppor those opportunities and that aspiration. Uh, so it is important, and I know we're under huge financial challenges. It is important that we bear in mind that if we cut one aspect, that it will have a ripple impact on many others. Thank you. Um, David Hillage. Thanks, Chair. Two or three questions. And in indeed, Chair, but I won't test your patience. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Minister, you're aware of the, the argument being put forward on a number of occasions, both here and within the, the Chamber, in relation to the, the community sports hubs. Yes. Uh, everybody has identified it as, as a way forward. From basic social inclusion for young, the elderly, disabled, disadvantaged, and whatnot, has any has the department carried out any work at this stage in relation to trying to move forward towards a Scottish model? And we had the opportunity to go and look at that and the advantages that that has. Has anything been done at this stage in relation to that? Well, again, thank you for your your question. I actually met uh, with this, the Scottish minister and actually received some paperwork and some background information and we have an understanding that will I mean this work's going to be continued. Um, as I, I, I met, uh, had meetings as part of Commonwealth Games and actually had some first hand experiences of what the benefits of those hubs look like, even in talking to some of the volunteers who have been working. Well people like ourselves who coach the under twelve soccer team, you know, they're actually involved in the Clydesiders <coughs> involved in the Commonwealth Games. Um, so yes, a lot of, there is a lot of talk and a lot of support for the Scottish model, and we're certainly exploring that, and I know Sport and I are doing the same. Um, but there are challenges around, do you do a couple of big hubs, and if you do, what funding do you have left for the smaller community-based developmental work that will actually lead on to that? And I think that discussion is still ongoing. And I'd like to see a complexion of probably some of both. Uh, and again, even some of the discussions I've had with the DE Minister um, around using schools to contribute towards community and sports hubs as well. And I know there's guidelines that have been out around you know, the usage of schools and that. But rather than waiting, <coughs> God bless you, rather than waiting to see what money we'll have or what money we're going to get, uh, I think there's things that we can do, can do meanwhile. Mm -hmm. And while they may be meanwhile projects, it's not to say that they will not be uh, part of a bigger community <coughs> hub, a race, a community hub programme in the future. So, yes, I do have seen some of the community hubs, have spoken about it, have met with the Scottish Government, do intend to continue those meetings in the future. I know Sport and I have done and will continue to do the same. And certainly it's something we need to conclude on before we actually settle on what the next CSR will look like. Um, but again, it is important that different and the various departments and bodies talk to each other about what we can do collectively as well. And equally so to our funders as well, because certainly Absolutely. some people will fund community projects Absolutely. but will not fund 
explored and not gone large, but yet they can bring all these things together under the one roof, and bring all the people out of their silos and start bringing Again. money together as well. Chair, with your indulgence, we have spoke about this before, particularly in terms of the opportunities around the new super councils uh, and opportunities around uh, DSD, super councils, health. Um, and again, sport and I and D call. It's really important that the small bits of investment we can bring collectively if we put our heads together actually means that some projects will work. Thank you. Um, Bosom Cray. Good. Um, what uh, view do you take about uh, pension reform and whether that's going to have an impact on the voluntary sector or indeed your arm's length bodies? Have you got a specific question? When we were down at um, Waterways Ireland, they did mention that they had to make uh, considerable um, provision, which was anything into the capital. I think it went up by about one million euro per year, and so that's going to have an impact on their uh, on their budget. Am I right in saying that? Or? And the second thing is, anybody that is a voluntary organisation, we seem to rely upon a lot of that in your sector, will now have to uh, take their pension. Um, on the balance sheet, and many trustees will not accept it because there's a personal liability. Okay, well, I think you want to talk about the Waterways Ireland stuff. Um, the North South Pension Arrangements for Waterways Ireland are the same as they are for every uh, body. What has yeah. happened to Waterways Ireland is that the uh, pension profile uh, has shifted, and the two sponsor departments are working with Waterways Ireland to see how best this uh, pressure on their uh, finances can be managed. And the Minister has referred to you know, where priorities lie in terms of where funding uh, uh, is allocated. And there, uh, over the uh, past two financial years, the level of efficiencies sought from Wales Ireland by uh, the Department of uh, Arts Heritage and the Guildhawk exceeded the minimum efficiency levels set out in the finance guidance agreed by both uh, finance ministers. So this has put an added pressure on Wales Ireland. In addition, obviously, Waterways Ireland has, over its lifetime, expanded considerably the uh, inland waterway uh, network. So it's a combination of those pressures, and the chief executive and her team are working through uh, the various options in terms of how those pressures can be managed within the resources available. The minister continues to uh, make her position clear on the uh, imposition of efficiencies above the minimum set out in the uh, guidance, which brings added pressure to the body. Her position is um, untenable. Yes, sir. Uh, pension. But just, it was just, it just a follow-up, chair, because it wasn't. That was a civil service answer. If Arthur doesn't mind, that told to me, leave me at the pension. I'm telling you, the information is that pension provision in Waterways Ireland goes up one million, two million, three million. It's unsustainable. It's not about efficiencies. It's a really large number. I would like to know what concrete proposals the department has for dealing with that. So at the start of my answer, I outlined that the, the pension arrangements for the north-south bodies are that the pension liabilities are to be met by the bodies from their resource uh, budgeting. Therefore, if your pension costs are going up for whatever reason, and there are particular reasons to, to do with the age profile in Waterways Ireland, why that has in increased, it's uh, on the management team to come up with options as to how to make the best use of the uh, available resources. The two sponsor departments are aware of this and have been working with Waterways Ireland uh, to find a solution to this uh, issue. Okay. Thank you. Um, we are doing well for time, so um, we'll give people a second chance. If anyone has asked a question, wants to ask another one, please indicate. But we'll start again now, going around um, Gordon. And yes, just uh, Minister, on the, the priorities again. Even in relation to the debate today, there, there is quite a strong emphasis on the languages here within the room. Uh, to me, as a new member, is there, I see a risk here that languages may be getting more of a priority rather than, than other arms length bodies, and the cuts may well hit other areas rather than, than languages, where you seem to have a strong emphasis. Well, um, <coughs> first of all, the discussions. Um, in the in previous have been varied. Uh, maybe this morning it's focused on non-languages because that's the questions we're being asked. It's not to say that that's just my main focus. I mean, my concern, and I want to make this totally clear, is particularly in relation to the Forest and the Ulster Scots. The proposed uh, efficiencies that Arthur explained very, very clearly are that we were asked to go above and beyond what 
was already agreed by both finance departments. And from my point of view, that would have a greater and more la la lasting impact on the Ulster Scots Agency in particular. In fact, it would mean that parts of their work would be wouldn't be viable at all and would have a detrimental impact on them. So uh, it's not to say that uh, I'm taking a different approach to the, uh, the, the language bodies, the money I'm to the ALBs. It's just that there are different pressures and different requests and demands <coughs> have been uh, asked. Uh, and you know, you can't compare the All Ireland bodies to um, the situation up here at the moment. It's it's the, the approach that we were asked to do was something completely different. Um, and I will continue to argue that the efficiencies that we agreed, that were agreed by both we as ministers and again agreed by both finance department, should stand. Uh, in terms of the other ALBs, in terms to the ALBs, sorry, um, as I said to you previously. The ALBs have been working for some time almost on a zero-based budgeting approach. So they are already aware of the amount of money they had annually to spend and already aware of their programme for government commitments and indeed the departmental priorities and actually embraced and welcomed those opportunities, not only to do what they do best, but to do things differently, which actually bring more people across their, fr their thresholds. Um, and it is regrettable that they are now having to look at what they prioritise, but that responsibility comes with a huge public investment and they are best placed to bring forward proposals that will not only steer them through these current financial times, but actually set out the direction of travel in the new CSR, and certainly for 15 and 16, which is said earlier is their best budgeting for them all. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Minister. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Um, the information that we have from libraries in Northern Ireland is that you know, when all cuts, deficiencies and so on are, are uh, come together, that there could be a reduction of between 10 per cent, 14 per cent in the budget. And uh, I was wondering if the, you know, if the window for bids is totally closed now for the October monitoring, or is there still an opportunity to make uh, a bid? Mm. And if so, would you be considering uh, making a bid which would perhaps enable the, the libraries to uh, operate uh, without uh, the sort of reduction in hours that they're facing? And just uh, as a follow-up to Gordon's point there, could I ask you if there is a reduction uh, from um, this administration to the Forest and Agalica budget, would that not have a knock-on effect? That's, that's interesting how that relates to libraries. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about funding. It's all about funding. Yes. Would that have a knock-on effect uh, to the funding provided by the government in Dublin? Would you ask Peter to answer the libraries um, question? Um, the, the figures you quoted uh, on libraries are, are not the figures for, for the in-year for the 14-15 position. Um, I've, uh, I've asked libraries as accounting officer to prepare to make 4.4 per cent savings and to set out how they would make savings up to 6 per cent, subject to what the executive might decide. The 10 to 14 per cent figure is the planning assumption that I've asked them to develop scenarios for for 15-16. So that's merely that just to explain that. In terms of whether we'd make a bid, you, I think the, the principle is that where um, the executive has decided uh, an area is not to be protected and decal is not protected, we can't simply bid to have the cuts re reversed because otherwise everybody would be in that place and you just end up um, uh, never being able to make a decision. So any bids that would be made would be on for specific things that would be outside of the scope of, of, of the normal um, budgetary process. And, uh, and again, to the, the funding, um, admire your ingenuity, your funding for uh, Forest and Gilgal and the rest. It's just to repeat that the pot of money that we received for both Forest and Gilgal and Ulster Scots, I'm trying to honour uh, as best and respectfully as I possibly can. I have no control over what the Irish government haven't done. Uh, it is disappointing, disappointing that they have decided 
to uh, cut back on languages as opposed to uh, taking the efficiency from waterways. That's our business. Uh, the commitment and the portfolio that I received in relation to funding for forests and for Ulster Scots Agency uh, remains the same. OK, OK. Thank you. Um, can I just ask, I don't know, I'll come then to, to be able to chat to that. Um, when, when it says about commitments that are inescapable, what's the definition of inescapable or what constitutes that? Well, you, you will know that the official definition of inescapable is things that are contractually, you're contractually obligated to. Um, and um, so the the, I suppose the, the grading will go from unescapable to high priority to priority to desirable, <coughs> the essential to desirable. So, um, and there are certainly things that are uh, unescapable now, but not necessarily will be unescapable in a new CSR. So, uh, for me, it is about what we're contractually obliged so to do. That's the definition that's been used. Well, yeah. well, well, certainly that's the one that most of us, if not all. Right. Or, or whether a statutory obligation is on Sorry, us. or whether a statutory obligation, for example, like disability. Right, fair You know, does it DDA or such? And again, I would argue Section 75 as well. What are the say? So it would be things that are contractual or things that are statutory. So um, nearly all of our arms length bodies have a statutory duty within the Act that sets them up um, to provide um, a, a library service or a museum service. Uh, and, Sports and, or arts. Yes, yeah. and it sets, it sets it out clearly. In addition, then there are a range of things that the department is behoved to do in terms of health and safety and a whole raft of other things that yeah. they, they would all be considered inescapable. Yeah. OK. And you also mentioned then Section 75 issues that they could <coughs> come in. Right. It'll be interesting just to have a look maybe at what is inescapable and, and under which heading it, it comes in. Thank you. Um, David Hildish. Thanks, Chair. Um, <clears throat> just following the financial situation in relation to obviously the difficulties that we do have here locally, how, how is the department structured or best placed to take advantage of uh, European funding? Uh, do you feel we're best structured for that? Are we missing, are we missing out or should we be doing something better? Well, I, I do believe that, particularly in Europe, there have been missed opportunities in the past, um, uh, particularly around potential sporting infrastructure, but certainly presently around cultural opportunities in Europe. Uh, I know the Arts Council, and we have met with people in Belfast City Council who have been quite successful in securing uh, structural funds in Europe. Uh, I do think we need to try and exploit better and again um, uh, exploit better opportunities to lever uh, European funds that obviously if we are you know we can if we can potentially identify programs then it means to say you'll need to almost set aside a percentage of your budget to match fund those but uh, I would like to see better opportunities coming out of Europe. Yeah, sorry, just chair with the, the, the onset of the Super Councils yeah. in April, again, better linkage on that Absolutely. matter of European funding potentially, yeah? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I just don't think any of us have the luxury of sitting back waiting <coughs> opportunities fall in our lap. I think we need to be almost to a point of being uh, aggressive about going out and looking for potential investment there. I mean, other council areas and Belfast have been very successful. But other council areas complain, have complained to me in the past about the success of Belfast, uh, um, and they didn't have the wherewithal, the staff, to, you know, go and lever in these uh, investment. Me, me hopefully that will be corrected come come April, and everyone will have an opportunity to, to maybe tap into resources that they didn't even know existed previously. But I, I'm taking the same attitude. I'm asking. Uh, for certainly within arts and sports, but maybe even other areas to look to see what opportunities we maybe could avail of in Europe. Okay, thank you. Um, Rosie McCorney. Um, given uh, the the delay in, in the case in the stadium, and I mean we all know that it's in it's a waiting court decision on the planning. Um, go ahead. If if it gets to go ahead. Um, 
would you be confident that the budget will be there to deliver the project in time? Well, as a member, I'm just going to be very cautious about what I say about the ongoing court case because I can't really discuss the detail of that. So just to say that up front, but I think there's an appreciation of that. I don't want to be uh, certainly uh, in contempt of any court proceedings. But if we take a, an approach where, uh, you know, if a judgment comes forward that upholds the plan on approval, then certainly I have no indication uh, that the funds for casement will not be there. Every indication that they're there, not just for casement, but for Windsor Park and indeed for the sub-regional, for Windsor or for soccer. Um, and the opportunities that, in particular, casement will have are going to be vast. Uh, not just pre-construction, but right. obviously construction and <coughs> post-construction as well. As we've already entered into relationships, not just with Belfast City Council, but particularly with some of the local uh, community and voluntary sectors, some of the small business sectors, about how we can make sure, and again, even with Dale, um, how we can make sure that the long-term unemployed in those areas aren't <coughs> living in them and looking at you know great uh, infrastructural investment and don't see themselves as having or being part of it. So it really is important that uh, very quickly, if we you know are in a position just to basically go ahead as planned, but we're still albeit very tightly still within the time frame for having both Windsor and uh, Casement delivered by 2016. Could, could you just ask, because it was raised the other week, um, has there been any update, or could we have an update on where the court case is? Are there many more submissions to be made? Or uh, My understanding, Chair, is that we are into our final days of court. Right. And um, I, I, I know that the court case has lasted longer than everyone anticipated. Uh, I'm almost afraid to say we're in our last two days because I thought that last week and we're still here. So um, it would appear that we're in our last days of the, 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 the hearing. And I would hope that the hearing is concluded next week, by this time next week. And would that mean then that the decision would be made? No, or the decision will be made. I would say in mid to the end well, of November. I think it's um, it's obviously it's not for us to to say when the judge will will produce the the outcome. But obviously we hope it will be done quickly. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. But, uh, sorry, Church. Ju just to say uh, um, that because I would imagine that because the court case lasted longer than we expected, that that may have an impact on the time that the judge needs to take in order to reach a conclusion. I would imagine it would do uh, so. OK, Pastor McRae. Um, thank you. Are you aware of any financial issues that threaten the continued existence of the Ulster Orchestra? I'm aware of the Ulster Orchestra's financial position, even just from what I've read in the media. Um, uh, and different sets of media, um, and not to go into detail, and it's not to be disrespectful to yourself or even the committee. I will be having a meeting, a meeting with the Ulster Orchestra soon. Um, I'm also, I have been aware that the Ulster Orchestra have been facing financial difficulties for some time. Um, but certainly, even just going by some of the media reports that I've read recently, uh, the position goes from scurry to scurrier. So um, maybe you could just help me a wee bit, though, on it. I mean, I have heard uh, from reliable sources that if it's not resolved by November 15th, that the Ulster Orchestra will cease to exist. Is that your understanding? Well, again, I have read speculation in papers, um, and I just look forward to, rather than speculating what the Ulster Orchestra are going to talk to me about, I would rather just approach the meeting uh, and hear what the Ulster Orchestra have to say, and then turn and hear what we have to say on the basis of what proposals they may be bringing forward. Because I also understand that from some media reports they're doing meetings with ministers about uh, rescue packages. So, we, just a, one last question, Chair, please. Just, I'll be very short. It's a three uh, part one. But I've been very efficient in my questioning. Uh, Minister, I just think that you, as the Minister for Culture, Arts and Leisure, ought to be the pivotal role in this. This 
should be your lead. <coughs> and I, I pick up what you're saying about it's unfortunate that you're having to read things in the papers and such like. Um, I really would urge you to, to, to take what I think is your rightful position of actually take command of that situation and, and see what can be done. And you might indicate if, when you've had meetings, about how you might let us know how you're getting on. Well, um, I thank you for your questions and I thank you for your opinion. Um, but uh, me taking my rightful place, you're right, I am Minister in responsibility for Book Arts and Leisure. But the member also needs to be aware and um, again, um, it's curious that he talks about big yachts and big orchestras. You just wonder who the member <laughs> talks to. But the uh, issue for me is... is the really same is, exception of the BBC that you were. Yeah, well, I read lots of things in the papers. And when I meet the groups who are you know, linked with certain comments, more often than not, they aren't responsible for those comments at all. So see, to be fair to the orchestra, I'm on, I understand that they're in a very, very... Uh, they're in a, sit a financial situation that is concerning for them. But I also want to wait and hear what they have to say rather than rely on what I read on the paper. And no disrespect to you, but rather than rely on what your very good, well placed sources had to say. In a point of order, Chair, um, is it an order for me as a member to ask questions about the Ulster Orchestra? Because the Minister seems to have taken some exception to the fact that I'm going on asking about the Ulster Orchestra. So this was something I was spoken to about yesterday and I thought it was appropriate to raise and it's November the 15th. And uh, indeed the representatives of the Ulster Orchestra spoke to a number of people. Indeed. In yeah, thank you. Um, Castle Hushing. Uh, um, so uh, I know that we're getting receiving a presentation from Libraries NA next and, and uh, a number of us have been lobbied by management staff and unions and others in terms of that. And I'm just thinking, just uh, maybe a more general question, notwithstanding um, inescapability, commitments or priorities, uh, I just wonder how best um, the, the Parity or proportionality of any funding uh, for AOBs will be wheeled out in the, in the in the time to come. Well, um, first of all, uh, I mean you will be receiving uh, so you will be receiving a delegation from the libraries. It's really up to the libraries. They know what the, they need to do. It's up to the libraries to come forward with proposals and how they're going to meet their core business within the fund portfolio that they have. I'm very, very sympathetic to the work that the libraries do. I appreciate and value the work that the libraries do, certainly the work that they do with other departments. But I think that, that there are questions that the libraries need to answer in the first instance. Uh, happy to meet and will be meeting with libraries and indeed their staff site representatives in due course. Have, have met them and will continue to meet them. Okay. And other ALBs? And, and the same for other ALBs. I mean, the other ALBs. Um, we, we have recently uh, brought all the ALBs, the church and chief executives together to have, uh, well certainly not just because of the financial situation, but just because a lot of them, there's a lot of crossover and a lot of them are doing really, really good work together. And they do want to explore the potential for greater work and better working relationships and crossover of work in the future. Um, but again, all the other ALBs have been given a fund and portfolio and have been asked to make priorities around the, the, the efficiencies that have been proposed. Okay. Sorry, could I just, sorry, just, sir, um, sorry, I'll keep it to the end if you don't mind, sorry. Oh, all right, okay. Um, Oliver and Mimbo. Yes, Chair, thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, just in a, in a very light-hearted uh, one. <laughs> <laughs> Parish of thought. <laughs> no, I'll never catch on. On the, uh, on the really success of the Giro d'Italia and, uh, and the upsurge in cycling, and which adds to, uh, you know, not only sport, but better health for young people and all that there, gives them a real good focus now, and you see that all around the country. Is, uh, are we... Any... Uh, are we... Pointing towards the, the uh, Tour de France or anything like that there. This is a big question that's out there. You know? Well, I think it's a big question you need to ask the Deputy Minister, you know, in fairness to yourself. Um, certainly the Giro, and particularly even in the members' consistency, the photographs of the horses galloping along a beach parallel to the, the cyclists going down has been now, you know, circling it worldwide. 
Um, but certainly I would be keen, um, as a colleague of the Daddy Minister, to ensure that some of those big world-class events are here on our shores. I do believe it helps a tourism product. I do believe it helps uh, local businesses. I also believe it helps uh, people who are involved in sport and culture and arts to find new ways of getting involved in events. So they do have you know, huge impacts right across the board. But I do believe that is a question uh, for the Daddy Minister in the first instance. Could, could just um, pick up on, on one point that you you'd made earlier on, and that was in relation to museums and free admission for people from disadvantaged areas. Um, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, can you remember just uh, obviously that's not the Ulster Museum that's it's free anyway, but obviously the Ulster American Folk Park and Ulster Folk Transport Museum. Um, how was that what was the extent of that over what period? Maybe give us some detail on that? Or, or just even an outline or send some information on? Yeah, so we'll certainly can send you information on like for example, we asked the museums, well, all the LBs, but because we've asked about the museums, to look at ways to try and ensure we bring or give opportunities for people who normally have maybe never thought about going to a museum or maybe went on a school trip or went when it's raining or whatever, start using the museum a bit more. Um, now, museums are providing opportunities for free admission on the sites for 2,500 households from the top 20% of areas of multiple deprivation. And the member will know that includes rural areas as well, and it you know, includes areas outside of the top 10%. Uh, they've also offered opportunities, um, particularly around, like for example, the Night of the Museum, where children who were in care looked after had an opportunity to literally have a Night in the Museum. Um, and that was free, and it was really, really important that when I was looking at bids, particularly monitoring rounds, that when I asked the ALBs, if you had an opportunity to do something completely different, in addition to what you're doing already, what would it look like? To do and I furnished the museum, they brought proposals like that forward, and it's proposals like that, I think, not only will ensure that people come back to the museum, but certainly those who would never have thought of going into the museum in the first instance will definitely come back again. It's really important that museums are given support and continue to do that. Thank you. Um, I gather there was something else you wanted to I do, make um, a final comment. It's, it's, well, if there's no other, are there no other questions? No, I think we've... Uh, not allowed. No, we've gone through the list completely, yes. Um, I think one of your colleagues said they weren't allowed, so do you want to certainly do you want to cause anarchy in your committee on my first appearance here? That would be just too much. So, so, so much time we could, of course, get some more questions. Yes, surely. <laughs> well, well, I, but no, uh, there was something I think you were. No, uh, first of all, uh, in response to uh, Basil McRae, um, I, I, I don't, I'm not avoiding questions, but I am not going to ask answer questions based on speculation. So I have been a member of a committee. I'm aware of your, your uh, powers to call people and papers, and I'm included within that, and I don't want to be disrespectful. But equally, I think it is disrespectful to the organisation that you asked about to comment on speculation. I want to give them their place and be fair to them. And that goes for everything else. Certainly there are things that are in the media about all sorts of stuff that people ask me for comment on. And when I don't give them the answer that they would like, um, they, they probably feel that I'm avoiding or talking out. That is not the case. So it's to be respectful to the member. That is not the case at all. Um, equally, I'm conscious that there are certainly things in the media about cuts, particularly to arts and cultural and sporting events, um, that I think is unhelpful. Um, but I will do all I can, because I firmly believe that the power of arts and sports in particular just where I've seen and experienced small amounts of money have gone a long way. I want to do my best to ensure that they happen. And I, but I think it's important that we get into conversations that have an outcome. So it's not all just process, that actually have an outcome. And uh, I, I, it is with regret that uh, sometimes you see things in the media um, and you know people are left in a situation where it's adding to the uncertainty. Uh, and again, and just to finalise, when they to say with the, member and the uh, member's indulgence and the chair's indulgence when we have concluded uh, 
all the, the discussions around October monitoring and everything. We're happy to provide details to the committee. And indeed, if there are any questions coming out of things that were asked today, the people here want further information on, I do my best to endeavour them either through the committee and certainly if they want to ask me in written form, I'm happy to, to do my best to answer those as well. I, I spoke to you the other day and kind of a briefing on some things and you mentioned there about the, the strategy. Yes. What, do you want to comment on that today or keep that for again? Well, you can keep it again, but certainly what we'll do is, I mean, some of the issues that have been raised today, if we feel that there's further follow-up information that we can provide on those questions, even within the next fortnight, we're happy to do that. And that includes the uh, ticket talking about the, the stra yes, language yeah. strategies. No, 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 no the arts and cultural strategies. Arts and cultural strategies, yeah. sorry, yes. That includes those as well. In uh, terms of details of consultation, the terms of reference, sorry, the terms of reference, consul consultation dates, and hopefully what form that consultation or those consultations will take. Happy to bring those forward to the committee as well. Okay. Is that far enough? That's, that's fine at this stage. Okay. That's good. Thank you indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So on the basis of... Um, <laughs> We'll, we'll get a transcript of what was uh, said, uh, the, the responses to the questions, and uh, we can look at that. But in the meantime, are there any actions that members want to take in light of what was raised there? Well, I, uh, could could I the would, caucus on the left? I, no, no, I uh, the caucus on the left. Okay. Um, right, yes. Just on the, the point about the Ulster Orchestra, I do think maybe we might write to the Minister and ask her to keep us abreast of things. I think it might be useful also to make initial contact with the orchestra. Mm. The I think that would be an excellent idea. Rather than, so we're actually going in with firm <laughs> information excellent. from their chair and chief executive. Excellent. And can I just say, for the record, I thought I had asked open questions that just invited a response. The minister seemed to take some umbrage with it, and uh, just said I didn't mean to cause him umbrage. I was merely asking questions that were in the public domain. And the minister then decides they'll answer as they see fit. It's the question of taking umbrage, and, and I actually don't like, not that I'll do anything about it, but this connection between luxury yachts and Ulster Orchestra. I think that's mm. the wrong way to be looking at things. But as it may, all I'm doing is we were trained on how to ask questions. I did the way that we're trained, and I've done it. And I do think that we ought to be looking at the matter, but you've kindly agreed to take matters thing forward. Yes, well, we'll write to the orchestra and then we'll get a response, hopefully, for maybe even for next week. We have the letter off quickly. Chair, sure, I, 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 I would support the points that Barton has raised. I've been openly uh, lobbied about this by constituents who are in the Ulster Orchestra and are genuinely concerned about the future of it in relation to funding. There are major issues there, major issues of concern. I'm glad that Basel did raise it, and it's something we need to highlight and, and we need to push because it seriously is under threat. And People are, who are full-time musicians are very concerned about the future of it, and I think we need to do what we can to try and lobby for it. And there's clearly an issue there where we're conscious of that, everyone's conscious of that. The question is the extent of the of the issue and the mm -hmm. pressures. Um, it, it is always a matter of concern to people in the orchestra, as you rightly say, all the people who attend the concerts, and keep it more widely because the orchestra does have um, a significant role in Northern Ireland, even in terms of marketing Northern Ireland abroad with um, international events and so on. So um, we, we'll have something back, hopefully, on that for for, for next week. Okay. Uh, um, yes. I've been inclined to agree with Basil. I think the minister's reaction to actually asked the question mm. was totally unwarranted. I mean, uh, that's the reason that we're here, and ministers know that, and they can answer questions whatever way they like. But I don't think they can challenge the rights of members here to 
uh, raise specific issues and ask questions about them? Well, we'll we're, we're going to pursue the, the matter. Uh, okay. Uh, to, to yeah, the but it's just a question. It's just a question of you know, you know. I think all the members here treated the minister with respect, and likewise, you know, she has a duty to treat us with a certain degree of respect. But anyway, I'll move on to uh, the minister mentioned there that the strategies, the Irish language strategy, and also Scots strategy, were in the process of being translated. Um, I think uh, we should ask the minister. Uh, that uh, the members here be given um, advance sight of them before they're published, uh, before they're made available to the general public. Right, yep, yep. I'm not sure they're necessarily through the executive. Uh, or, 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 they, yeah, she would have to circulate those around the executive. Said they, have they have been to the executive. Said, right. Right. But have they, have, they, have, they, have they all responded? Or? Yeah, she said that. Uh, she, she had she was happy with the responses that she got. Right. We'll find out. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But we'll get those. Yes. Um, um, uh, presumably, then. <coughs> we, actually, could we just check when she's intending to go out to launch the timeline for that? Um, and we can. Um, we can take it maybe a session at some stage to have a more detailed look at those. Of course, yes. Yeah, sorry, Catholic, yes. Chair, far be it from me to defend the Minister. I think she's well capable and able of doing that herself and does on many occasions, been in the Chamber. But I think that what she, what she was referring to there was some misinformation. You know that? Misinformation that is in the ether out there. Uh, and, you know, that's her right as well, so I'd defend her that. Okay, well, we'll move on to the next item, which is the um, <coughs> Libraries NI. Can I refer members to page 51, which is the, the uh, memo that you have from the clerk, and then page 57, which is their um, briefing paper. And um, yes, we can bring them in, please. Ari Knox as the, the um, Chief Executive and Helen Osborne, then the, the Director of Library Services, with us this morning. And <coughs> thank you indeed for coming along to the committee today. Um, could I start out just by in, in welcoming you and inviting you to make an initial presentation? Um, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to the committee for the invitation to come along today um, to talk to you about the action we're taking to manage uh, the in-year reduction in budget. Um, you've received a briefing paper from us, um, so I don't propose to go through it in detail. Um, maybe just to highlight some of the key points. Um, we're then, of course, happy to try and answer any of the questions that you might have, but I'm not guaranteeing that we'll have answers to all of them because it still is very much a, a fluid situation that we're involved in. Um, as you know from our briefing paper, the plans that we're currently implementing are designed to deliver £1.4 million pounds of savings in a year. Uh, two, two, the 2.1% that was agreed at the Executive Committee meeting uh, as far as the June monitoring round is concerned, and then a further 2.4%, which we understand and we know has not been agreed yet, but which we've been told to factor in and plan for. Uh, the, the table uh, in our paper that we gave you shows the budget headings um, where those savings are being found. Staffing uh, and the staffing budget is by far the largest element of our costs because libraries are a frontline service and we need, uh, a suitably, we need um, suitably qualified and experienced staff in those frontline posts. Whether that's in branch libraries, on mobile libraries, in the home call service, the heritage libraries, or key service priority teams, we need the staff to be able to deliver the service. The vast majority of staffing costs are obviously associated with salary and employer's costs, and there's a very small element for training. We've reduced, we've had to reduce the staff budget by £590,000. Um, and since permanent staff have contracts of employment in place, which can't be altered in the short term, we've had to implement a recruitment freeze, except for posts that are considered absolutely essential. 
to ongoing service delivery. Regrettably, we've also had to release agency staff who've been in the service. And agency staff are used to provide cover uh, for vacancies, for maternity leaves, for annual leave, career breaks, sickness, absence and so on, in frontline services. With fewer staff, then, we've also had to review the opening hours of our libraries and to reorganise staff timetables to seek to reduce the need to provide cover. Uh, and that's quite difficult. We're trying to ensure that libraries remain open at the busiest times and that there's minimum disruption to core programmes, such as, for example, our Rhythm and Rhyme programme, which attracts large numbers of preschool children and their parents, uh, or the School Class Visits programme, which is arranged months in advance with individual schools. So in some instances, particularly in our larger libraries, which are open to at least 8 o'clock on three or four nights a week, we're proposing to reduce the number of late night open openings and to reorganise the staff timetables then to provide cover at the rest of the time. In some of the other libraries, it may perhaps mean closing over lunchtime. Uh, in others, it may mean opening a bit later in the morning or closing a bit earlier in the afternoon. Um, in some libraries which are single staffed, um, it may be necessary to have what we're calling planned ad hoc closures. And by that I mean if, for example, there is a programme running in a library which is single staffed, normally we would have brought in a second member of staff while that programme was ongoing so that one member of staff could be involved in the programme and another member of staff would have covered the rest of the work in the library. Um, we may no longer be able to do that. So we're, what we're saying is we may have to close the library for the duration of that programme, having given advance notice to the public that that would be the case. We're planning to have the new temporary opening hours in place by the beginning of November, the latest. And I emphasise they are temporary. Um, by the end of next week, we should be able to publicise those hours and make the public aware of them. Uh, but we are still working through that process with some libraries. It is the case, however, that there may also be temporary ad hoc closures of libraries in the meantime, and indeed after uh, the revised opening hours are introduced. And that's more likely to happen in the smaller single-staffed libraries. Um, if, for example, a member of staff is ill or has pre-arranged annual leave to take, um, where previously we would have provided cover, we, we probably can't afford to do that any longer. We want to try and rule out those ad hoc closures if we can, try and avoid, avoid them if we can, but uh, I can't rule them out completely. It may happen. Um, I realise that paints quite a bleak picture, um, but it's important to remember that even with this temporary reduction in opening hours, we still have 98 libraries located across Northern Ireland, and they will continue to operate and provide a wide range of services, albeit with uh, reduced opening hours. It's important also that we note that, there, that uh, vacant posts in other areas of our work, in, in terms of our support services, have also been frozen. Um, so in our finance, payroll, procurement, HR, ICT, marketing, administrative support, posts have also been frozen there. The other two major budget headings uh, being reduced are stock and plant maintenance. Um, and as the committee knows, stock is, is the lifeblood of our service. Um, and we know that significant cuts in the stock budget mean that we will be unable to provide the range and the quantity of new books that we've done in the past. Um, it also reduces our ability to be responsive to customer needs. Um, at this stage, we're working with a stock budget that has been reduced by 16% in a year. Um, our network of 96 branch libraries and our two heritage libraries our network is a key resource, not just for libraries in I have to say. Which are the two heritage libraries? The Irish and Local Studies Library in Armagh and the uh, Mellon Centre for Migration Studies in Omer. They're two separate ones. You may be thinking of Belfast Central, Chair, but that's part of Belfast yes, Central. Okay. So it's, not, it's not seen as an additional or a separate heritage library. Um, the network of libraries is a key resource, not just for us in Libraries NI, but for the range of other organisations with whom we work in partnership and who value the fact that libraries are used by people of all ages and from all sections of the community. Each year we spend a percentage of our budget on plant maintenance to ensure that those buildings are <coughs> warm, welcoming, <coughs> safe, attractive. Um, so, you know, we replace floor coverings before they uh, become unsafe. We replace boiler plant before it gives up. Um, reducing the plant maintenance budget, uh, as we have done by 19%, can only be a short-term measure. 
otherwise the physical condition of the buildings will deteriorate um, and that puts increasing pressure then on the response maintenance budget. There are other smaller budgets that I mentioned in the paper as well, uh, the briefing paper, which have also been reduced. Chair, I'll, I'll not go into those in detail, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Finally, Chairman, could, could I just say, I can't be sure that further savings won't be required in year. Um, we are obviously aware of the discussions that are ongoing today at the Executive. Um, I mentioned in the briefing paper to you that I have received correspondence from the Interim Permanent Secretary indicating that it may be necessary to increase the level of cuts this year to 6%, although obviously there's no decision at, that, at this stage. If that were the case, it would mean for us finding an extra half million, half million pounds, £500,000, and that would have to come from the stock and staffing budgets because those are the biggest budgets. Um, and I've mentioned also the fact that uh, the, the Interim Permanent Secretary uh, had provided in his letter to us planning assumptions for 15-16 on which we need to start working, and I've given you the information as to what that would mean for our budget. And that does mean that a fundamental rethink about how we deliver services. Can I just conclude, Chair, by saying that because of the short timescale involved, we know that this uh, emergency action um, has been pragmatic. Uh, more than planned, and we've had no option but to do that. It's extremely difficult for everybody involved, not least for staff right across the service. And our staff have faced many challenges over the last five years, um, since the organisation was established with strategic reviews of provision, with strategic reviews of mobile services, previous budget cuts which reduced opening hours. More recently, the whole implementation of our new ICT system. And I, I, I would want to put in record, Chair, that our staff have responded very positively to the changes. They've embraced them. Uh, they've continued to innovate and improve and deliver high quality services through all of that. And I am very proud of their professionalism and their commitment. And I know that even in these difficult times, they will continue to do their best to try and deliver um, a high quality service to uh, our public. And if I could just give you one example, uh, because it, it was brought home to me yesterday. Um, some of you will know I'm based in Lisburn City Library. And yesterday in Lisburn City Library, the branch staff, augmented by some staff from other areas, facilitated a teenage kicks high, um, health fair in the library, which was attended by over 500 young people from post-primary schools in the area. It was organised in partnership with Lisbon City Council and with the South Eastern Health and Social Care Trust. And it was designed to provide teenagers with important information to enable them to make healthy lifestyle choices. And events like that are taking place all the time in our libraries. And as far as we can, within the resources that are available, we will be trying to continue to deliver that kind of service. Um, I, I just want to say as well, Chairman, that Throughout our five years, we've tried to be responsive to our users, and we've enjoyed tremendous support from them. And I'm truly sorry that this will cause disruption for some of our users. Um, but I want to assure them that we will continue to seek to do everything we can within the resources that are available to deliver those high-quality services. OK, Chairman, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, first question there from Cathal O'Hushin, please. Thank you, Chair. Chair thanks, Larry, for your presentation. And say we all will be acutely aware of, of the efforts that have been made by staff and management right across the board. And I know that as recently as last night, I was talking to one of your senior managers, and they were explaining the creativity that they were having to think, think up in terms of how, how they were going to address that. Um, uh, uh, that having been said, I suppose there is a concern that some of the ancillary works, and I, as a rural representative, would always. Mm -hmm. They come from that angle. Some of the ancillary uh, uh, services that you provide, and you mentioned Rhythm and Rain, there's also the storytelling and, and, and uh, the access to terminals and all the rest of that. And indeed, a uh, wider thing um, coming into the review of the, the, mo the mobile libraries. Um, do you envisage at the moment any reduction, any significant reduction in that? Because that will have a great impact. In terms of in terms of local delivery in in rural areas, in terms of mobiles, in terms, in terms of mobiles of and, and, the, and the other services, yes. Um, the well, as far as uh, branch library services are concerned, while branch libraries are open, um, you know, for example, the, the computer terminals will be available. There's no there's no question about that. Um, as I said in my introductory remarks, we 
what we're trying to do in all our libraries is to make sure they're open at the busiest times when there are things like rhythm and rhyme running or class visits programs or story times or whatever and that's and that's the work that staff our, mar our managers are doing at the moment to try and reorganize timetables so that we can keep them open at those times as best we can as far as the mobiles are concerned um, as you know, we, we just completed a review of our mobile service uh, about a year ago now, and from the start of this year we introduced new timetables. We want to try and keep that running as best we can. We, we have no plans at this stage not to keep the mobile service running to the timetables that exist unless there's an emergency situation arises. Because we've had feedback already about that mobile review um, through research that DECAL has carried out, which is showing that actually um, as a result of that mobile review and what we've done around our branch libraries, the percentage of people in Northern Ireland now who live within two miles of a service has, has increased from 83% to 89%. Now that's something I think that's very useful and as far as we can we, we want to try and maintain that. Okay. Chair, can I just welcome the, the publication in this next week, Erin, of the actual hours that you propose. As of, I just welcome that. That will clear up some of the uncertainty, certainly among staff. Um, yeah, we, we, it, Chair, if I could just say it is, it is a very difficult process that's being worked through at the moment because it's, it's all about reorganising staff timetables and that's quite sensitive in some issues because people have personal circumstances and so on that have to be addressed. So we are working through that at the moment. I would hope by the end of next week, at the very latest, we will have, for the vast majority of our libraries, the timetable sorted out. And at that stage, we'll be letting the public know as well through posters in the libraries, through a website, through social media, whatever. Thank you. Um, Gordon Dunn. Yes, thanks, Chair. I read in Helen, you're very welcome. I think we all appreciate the work you do. And uh, you. you know the North Down libraries in Bangor and Hollywood are extensively used. Um, in relation just to, you touched about current refurbishment projects, what will be the implications for, for further planned projects for refurbishment of libraries? As far as our planned, um, well, there are two types of refurbishment projects that we, could in, we would be involved in. Some smaller refurbishments are done through our planned maintenance programme, which is recurrent funding. Bigger projects are done through capital. Um, we have very little capital. We have no idea what capital we will have in the future. Planned maintenance, as I said, has been substantially reduced this year. So basically, very little refurbishment will, come, will happen for the rest of the year because the budget that we've already that we've now got has almost been committed already for the rest of the year. We're really saying that from now on, nothing, we'll not be able to do anything for the rest of the year. Um, there, are two cap there are two capital projects that are underway at the moment, uh, which we're very, and we got money for that in the June monitoring round. One was Listen to Ski Library, which is a new library, mm -hmm. and the other one was Moira Library, which is a smaller library, but which is in a very old prefab building, and we've got the money to, to um, start that this year. At least. So that's committed, so. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Helen. Uh, it might be worth adding, Chair, that there are two other projects ongoing in libraries, um, but not being driven by Libraries NI. They're libraries where we are the tenants, and those are Cross McGlen Library, which is due to reopen after the whole premises, which is a community centre, um, being refurbished in November, and then Carnlock, which has just closed recently for refurbishment and extension by the, by the council and that would open towards the end of the financial year. They're unaffected year. then? Those two are unaffected? Those two will continue because those are being done by the, the landlords, the councils. Yeah. Who's just the answer? PFI costs four, four, two, one, uh, thousand. Yeah. Is that one building or...? That's Lisburn City Library. Lisburn City Library so is the PFI. only PFI library uh, which we inherited. Um, so there's a, an annual charge for running the Spring City Library. Okay. And the the cost of the um, Wi-Fi um, it is the, is that entirely um, how much of that is Wi-Fi and how much of that is just in general? In terms of E2, yes. I'm afraid I couldn't break it down into that level is of detail. It, the whole E2 contract. That's the total E2 contract. That's the total E2 okay, contract, okay, so which is everything element. to do, including the free okay. Wi-Fi in all our okay. libraries, including new finance systems, new HR systems. All right, so that's only which absolutely everything. That's fine. That's grand. Uh, uh, yeah. right, um, Dominic. 
Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Good morning, and thanks very much for your uh, information. Um, what is the percentage reduction in the uh, investment in stock? Um, the percentage reduction that we're working on at the moment is, I, I just said that I forgot, it's 16 percent. 16 percent. And um, will that be spread evenly across uh, all um, types of stock, or will you prioritise it according to the frequency of use of certain items of stock? Okay. Um, the stock budget budget will have to be reduced in the same pragmatic way, or you could say emergency way, that we've had to reduce staffing, because some of the elements of our stock budget are annual subscriptions to online resources, journals and so on, that would have been taken out at the start of the year. Um, after that, we are reducing um, pretty much in proportion across the various categories of stock. But obviously, the smaller the budget, the bigger the impact on that particular area of stock. And some of our smaller areas would be large print, talking books, various languages, and so on. Um, the, the areas that are taking the biggest hit would be the children's stock, and the adult fiction. Um, and with adult fiction, that's particularly because we profile our spend throughout the year, and we're just coming into the time of year when there are the most titles published, because mm. publishers are looking to the Christmas gift market. Um, so, um, because we're having to be pragmatic and reduce where we can, that's being affected disproportionately as well. Okay. Um, and can I ask you about the? Um, are all libraries going to have reduced opening hours? Uh, yeah, I think maybe two or three, a few that won't. Helen knows it more detail about it. Yeah. The our current opening hours are based on bands of libraries. We have fifty-seven hours, forty-eight hours, forty, thirty, twenty-five, and eighteen. And there will be reductions in most of those bands. But we've taken a view that it's not sensible to go below 18 hours in any library. So in our 18-hour libraries, our smallest libraries, whilst there may be ad hoc closures, we're not temporarily reducing that 18 hours every week. So... Um, in other words, those which have been sort of pared down to a minimum in some places will not go any lower. <laughs> okay. And we said earlier on there that if there are, are ad hoc closures, that you'll do your best to warn people of them uh, in, 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 as far as far in advance as you can. Yeah, we, we're, we're using the terminology planned ad hoc closures and other ad hoc closures. Planned ad hoc closures are the ones that we would be able to tell where, for example, as I said, there may be something happening in a particular library which we're saying has to go ahead because people have been invited in advance or whatever, but we've only got one member of staff. That we should be able to notify people about well in advance. But if you have, for example, a single staff library and that member of staff happens to phone in sick hmm. this morning. Yeah. Then you know you can't. You, there's nothing you can do other than try and make sure that through social media and local mm. contacts and so on mm. that you can let people know as as quickly as possible until you can get the arrangements in place. Could I just pick up on on the point there about library stock and the, the reduction there? Um, just, is, is the three million pounds that was originally in there? Obviously, if you had £10 million, pounds, you'd spend it in stock, but was the £3 million seen as an adequate figure? To the point where you get down to cuts where not so much that people just stop going to the library because they've yeah, read everything. Absolutely. And 16% is a substantial cut, but if there were further um, cuts in budget, it is the one area where you could do a quick, um, have a quick impact. It's different from salaries where you have a a timeline. 
Could could just give me some ideas there on how you see that issue about stock. Helen has been involved with um, DECAL on <coughs> the production of the new public library standards, which have a figure in there around stock. So I've, I'll ask her chair if she, because she has a lot of detail on this that I don't have. Right. Our stock budget at the start of the year didn't actually meet the new standard for delivering tomorrow's libraries. And the figure that we're now looking at is, is well below that. Um, what what figure would it have it taken to, to actually get? We really need to be, to be, if we are to provide a comprehensive service, recognising that we're in a world where some people prefer print and some people want online resources, and it's going to be that transition for a good few years to come, um, really, we should be spending £3 a head to provide a first-class service. Um, Yes, although the detail standard, um, because uh, there has to be some realism in that kind of process of standard setting, is £2.25. Obviously, we're well below that. There is a view that it's possible to take a reduction in the stock budget for one year without too much impact. I think what it's important to understand there is that customers come to the library with a certain expectation of finding material on the shelf. If they don't find it, they might come back once but they're not going to keep coming back thinking, oh, the stock budget will be better next year. Also, the nature of publishing now means that publishers have very short print runs. They can't afford to have titles that aren't sitting on their shelf in their warehouses that they can't sell. So if you don't buy a title, whether that's a local history title or a popular novel, soon after publication date, and typically we would order in advance of publication, then we'll have missed it for forever. You can't catch up in the way that used to be possible. Sure. There was just one question there that I wanted to ask before you came in. Um, in the case of long-term illness, um, what happens in that case? I, I can see that you know a temporary closure can be short. Uh, but if some, if a member of staff has a, you know, turns out unfortunately to have a longer term illness, how, is the, how, how will you cope with that? Well, if it were a single staffed library, we would have to look at how we covered that because I don't, th you know, we're not about long term closures of any libraries in this. If it were a bigger library, where we could perhaps try and manage it with existing staff, we would have to, we'd have to try and cover it. I think, I think, Chair, what we'd want to be saying in this is there is no one size fits all answer to any of those issues. We would have to review every situation and every and look at each case in it, on its own merits and see what what needed to happen in that case. So it could be fluid. We just at this stage, it's it's a wee bit like at the moment trying to predict what might happen, and it's, it's quite difficult. OK, thank you. Thanks. Boss um, McRae. Um, do we really need 98 libraries? Um, I believe we do. Um, we have already been through, since Libraries and I was established in 2009, uh, when we took over from the five education library boards, there were 13 more libraries than there are now. We've been through two strategic reviews of provision, and uh, that's included major public consultations, equality impact assessments, rural impact assessments. Do need them open full time? Well, it depends what you mean by full time. We have our libraries are open on six bands. Our, our large libraries are open well, like Lisbon. the question then, Irene. If you reduce the opening hours, mm -hmm. what is the imp You'll have done some studies. What is the impact? Yeah. Yes, the impact is, well, first of all, um, the legislation and Delivering Tomorrow's Library says that we should be maximising access for people. So, as Helen said earlier, we have a number of small libraries in rural communities that are only open 18 hours a week. And we think that's needed because, you know, you can't, if you go below that, it's not worthwhile having a library at all. Our largest libraries are open 57 hours a week, which is allowed for late nights and Saturdays. Um, 
Reducing the opening hours is going to reduce access. If you think, for example, um, coming up to exam time, our libraries are full from first thing in the morning to they close at 8 o'clock, or in some cases libraries that were open to 10 o'clock, with young people who are studying. You reduce the opening hours then, you know, Will the young people come? Will they not come at all? Because it's you know it's going to be soon. so. We've been through a whole process as well of reducing our opening hours before. We think our libraries are now open for the amount of time that. Do, do you think that the demographics service. have changed of people using libraries? Habits have changed, but we still have a huge number of people who use libraries on a every year. I think our, our visits are are in the region of seven million. A year? Uh, in terms of the funding, you mentioned in Lisburn uh, that you had 500 uh, young people come along, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, did you get any financial contribution for that? It was paid for by the council and by the. So but does is it? No, it does. Do you... our, our contribution to it is providing the premises and the facilities. The council paid for. I'm not quite sure what, but they put money into it. Southern East, South, the, South, the Trust put money into it, and our contribution in kind was here's the library. The reason they do that and is. We organised it. I'm sorry, and we organised it, yes. The reason we do that is because libraries are seen by people like councils and trusts and loads of other organisations as being neutral venues. But you're doing things that are non-statutory, which is one of the things that we're... Well, it depends just, 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 no, Sorry, I don't yeah. want to take too long. So I just want to... Okay. Just a clarification. You mentioned, uh, Helen mentioned, uh, that the uh, in response to the Chair's question, that it should be ideally £3 per head. Mm -hmm. Is that per head of population yeah. or per head of people actually registered to go to... £3 per head of population is what... Would you ever consider that there was any value in looking for a contribution on a voluntary basis from members of the public that support libraries to the tune of three pounds per head? Um, it's been looked at in other areas. Uh, the legislation that currently wouldn't allow us to do that. Um, that would be a matter for policymakers to do it. But it has been it's been discussed in other fora. Um, we have no um, the, the the point from our pers our perspective is libraries are free at point of access. And we never stop people making contributions voluntarily, but we don't go out and ask them. I was immersed there in the calculation of what 1.8 million people times two pounds twenty-five was. <laughs> <laughs> My mother is a librarian, yes. therefore I'm not allowed to say anything bad. But I do think there is an issue about the numbers are stark. You're going to either have to close libraries or reduce opening hours or find some other form of funding because yes. there's no other money. Yes. That's the start choice and you have to do it in about eight weeks. Okay. Uh, that would be difficult given the uh, fact that when we've done anything like this and we do have to, by law, go through the quality impact assessments, rural impact assessments, public consultations and so on. But we recognise, Chair, that if the funding over the next few years is going to continue to decrease. We have to have a fundamental rethink about how libraries provide services. Just, uh, uh, did I pick you up there that there are some places where it's open beyond 8 o'clock? Did you say 10 o'clock? There are a couple of libraries that have been open at 10 o'clock. <coughs> The, the, there are two libraries in in that situ in that situation, but uh, without wishing to preempt the re re revised opening hours that will be publicised which, which shortly. Which uh, Bangor and Lisbon. Right. Oops. They were ours that we inherited for particular reasons, right. and, um, okay. but we, we won't be able to keep that going any longer. Thank you. Um, Oh, Basil, and um, no, Rosie, Rosie McCordy. Carly, and thanks for the presentation. Uh, and I mean, we just, um, I would take the view that that's the last resort would be closing any library. Um, they're a very valuable resource. Um, can I ask you, um, and I know that the whole talk has been around agency staff, what's, what's the staff complement that's required to maintain, the, what, what, what's, what's required at currently? Um, well, I think that's it's like a lot of this. It depends. Um, we currently have, right across our service, 790 members of staff. 
Um, now, a lot of those are part-time, so it's just under 600 full-time equivalent members of staff. Um, to, keep, to keep a service, our, our libraries are staffed currently, before we've had to introduce this, these measures, on the basis of having to reduce opening hours previously and having to cut our staffing at that stage. So our staffing levels are, we believe, at the, such that you know, libraries stay open, we provide the core services, um, you know, the people can do a little bit of outreach, they can run programmes like Rhythm and Rhyme and Storytime and so on. But every library is different because it depends on things as well, like is it a single floor library? Does it have two or three floors? Uh, because that might requ you know that requires more staff because you have to have um, you know for health and safety and, and all the rest of it. So it depends. Libraries are every library is different as far as that's as that's concerned. But um, you know whenever we took over, we we have reduced in the past five years our staffing complement by over two hundred full time equivalents. So we've you know we've reduced staff considerably. We think it, currently it's at the minimum to be able to provide. A, a, you know, the service that we are providing currently. And many agency staff um, do you have currently? Um, well, when we started this process, we had just over 100. Uh, to date, we have released 68 agency staff, and there will be a few more who will be going as well. Okay. Are they all different grades, or are they one? The vast majority of them are at the basic library assistant level because they come in to provide cover to you know, at that level. Okay. One last question. Can I ask just, are there, is there any opportunity to redeploy staff from elsewhere in the libraries? Providing the money comes with them. Okay. <laughs> because if the money doesn't come with them, it doesn't, okay. it doesn't help our budget. Oh, no, but, no. you know, we're always very welcome, we're always very pleased to have people come as long as the money comes as well. Right, thanks. I give in the good wine to the last, David Hill. Thanks, Chair. I'm not so sure. I think most of the stuff has been covered, but certainly I want to just... Thank you for your presentation, and it's been very useful. And I know from my own knowledge, certainly some of our most disadvantaged people in our communities actually use it every due to the internet access and various things like that. And it's crucial to how they conduct, conduct their, their lives. You, you did mention you've gone through two strategic reviews. With the present sort of cuts that you're facing, has the work that's been done through those reviews been lost to a degree? No. Do you see, obviously, it's a step back or some way along the line, but do you see that there's a loss? Well, I, I think those... Haven't conducted those reviews? Well, I think those strategic reviews... Um, as a result of those strategic reviews, in my view, um, we have now... What well, we, at that stage, started out to think of as being a sustainable library estate based on the finances and so on that were available at that stage. Yeah. And a, a, a library estate, which you know, where we have a mix of urban, rural, you know, we have twenty-eight libraries which are serving communities with with less than four and a half thousand people, often the only public facility in that community, used therefore by all sorts of organisations and and so on as a community hub, uh, as well. Um, we have 28 libraries that serve the 10% most disadvantaged communities. Um, it just so happens that those two figures are the same. They're not necessarily the same libraries. It just so happens it's the same figure, which makes it easy to remember. So we have a really good spread of libraries across Northern Ireland. And as I said earlier, the research that DECAL, has, DECAL Statistics has carried out showed that 89% of the population live within two miles of a service point. And that I think makes libraries a very useful, accessible place for people to come to access information, um, whether that's health-related information, whether it's people coming for learning purposes, whether it's people coming for leisure purposes. So there's a whole range of um, activities that go on. Yeah, I think that's a story that has to come out. Yeah. And it, moving on to the, the potential of a, of a 10 to 14 per cent, mm. Uh, cut. I know you've, you've put a paragraph together there at four or three, very kindly put together probably, but what is the harsh reality if that happens? What? I, I, I haven't got to that stage of thinking about that yet, to be honest, because we're truly trying to deal with this year. It does mean, I think what we have to remember as well is library services have transformed considerably in the last five years. And library services will always have to keep moving because the context out there in which we're operating, whether it's the social context, the 
economic climate, the technology that exists now is moving so quickly that we as a library service also need to move with it. And our E2 project, for example, has been very much <coughs> around that. Libraries will have to transform and how we deliver services will have to transform to continue to meet the needs of the public because their needs are changing. It takes you back to the strategic reviews again. Which and it takes you back and we may be back in a situation where we have to start doing... But you don't want to headline tonight by spelling it out on the 14%? No. I, I think that would be very unfair because we don't know. We have no, you know, that's a planning assumption at the moment. None of us know. We may know after today, but yeah, yeah. none of us know at, the moment, at this, this stage. In the case of just picking up the Cross McLean one where it's in a community mm. facility, is that a community owned facility that's entirely a library or a community facility that's partly the library and partly other things? It's the second chair, it's a community mm. centre which, uh, <laughs> where, where we have part of the centre as a library. Okay. And the other bit of it, is it, is it a Council Community Centre. Okay, right. Yes. And you get co location then again in the Grove um, in North Belfast. How, how many others are there? I, again, Lisburn would fall into that category, I suppose, as well. There's other things in that building. I mean, not. Well, well, it's a bit different, Lisburn, because it's a PFI building and, and there are office, right, there's yeah. office accommodation yes, there, but it's not. not, it's not, you know, it's kind of managed by the, the owner of the building. Yes, it's not. There's no synergy between there's no, the two. There's no synergy. But you do get that in yeah. the Grove and Cross Are there many others or are any others that um, you have that co-location? Straban chair would be a, an example. Um, right. On Hill knows well. Yes. The Straban Library is attached to the Arts Centre there, but there are also um, a series of meetings rooms that are used by the council and the library service. That's a partnership project. I think to, uh, one, one other one that we're looking at at the moment, we're working with Armagh City Council, um, who are proposing to refurbish what was St Patrick's Trian. And in doing that, uh, we currently have two libraries in Armagh, the, the Branch Library and the Irish Local Studies Library. And what we're doing is looking at working with the council in terms of re relocating both of those into a refurbished St Patrick's Trian, which would also have community facilities and, and council services in it but that's all subject to a, a planning process at the moment so it's it, it's you know it, we've always said that where there are complementary services then it's useful if the library is with those complementary services it's not always the case that it works but uh, you know those are the sort of examples that we that we have been looking at and uh, if anybody else has any other questions we'll take them but finally the Armagh Irish Local Studies, is that in with the museum in the, ma in the mall or is that No, it's oh. in the old hospital building, which, oh, yeah. <coughs> which is kind of behind the cathedral. Oh yes, yes, I know now. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, no other questions? Well, look, thank you very much for coming this morning. You'll appreciate that members are very, very supportive yes, of, of and I, I, I really appreciate your support on this. Thank you very much. And, um, we, we wish you well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any um, actions that the committee wants to take in light of that presentation? No. Further? I think, uh, Chair, we'll just wait till they come out, out with yeah, their... That's right. I think it'll be far better. Than, yeah, we, can, we can look at it after that. And Carnlock's safe. Carnlock's <laughs> safe, yeah. Good. Okay. Right. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the other items, then, we'll, we'll go through, because we're down to a quorum here. Um, can we um, look at the end of uh, session report and I'll ask the clerk to speak to that. Chair, we, we brought this to committee at the meeting on the 25th of September and as I said to members then, each statutory committee compiles one of these end of session reports that really detail 
projects that the committee undertook during the session of scrutiny that it undertook the outputs that there are, so it includes things like the inquiries, the investigation into child protection, so on that the, the committee undertook any statutory rules or legislation that they look at and so on. So really it's just um, bringing it back so that members have had a bit of time to have a look at it and seeking members' approval. Once that approval is gained, what happens is all of the end of session reports then go forward um, once they're all agreed and they go on to the Assembly website. Okay. So Chair, it's really just seeking that approval. Agreed. 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 Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Matters arising, um, there's a correspondence spreadsheet there at page 79, um, and that's moved on a wee bit since the last meeting where we looked at that. Um, so you'll see there um, we now have a response to the letter from the 5th of March in regards to the Collection of Information and Delivery uh, on LIFA, and that came in on the um, 1st of October. Um, are there any other points there in regard to that? Sure, just uh, apologies, I missed the end of September meeting in relation to the first of our battle phase, but the Milk Cup funding letter was received on the 26th. What did they, what was Chair, um, members will recall we'd written to um, a variety of, of potential funders. We'd written to the Deputy Minister, we'd written to the Decal Minister and so on. Um, on that, we've received responses back on those. With the Deputy Minister, it was highlighting what Deputy already um, gave to the Milk Cup in terms of the events funding pot. I think that was some, I'm going to say 63,000. I'm willing to be corrected on that. But it was a decal? The decal response indicated yeah. that um, essentially it set out what Daddy gives, and um, we didn't really get anything new on that uh, in terms of new funding. Um, the members, if I go further into the pack, we're having the Milk Cup uh, people up, I'm going to say next week, I think next week is right. Um, and they're going to expand on that, okay. so that was really what we were That's looking fine. for. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I appreciate yes. the letter back in terms of Leafa. Um, the question, however, I asked in March actually was about you know, an equivalence in terms of funding. Uh, I got little or no sense of it in that reply. I got little or no sense of it in the presentation from civil servants last week. So I think perhaps uh, you know, a letter asking exactly where that sits that would be good. I could refine. But yeah, we'll, we'll do a follow-up letter, um, being more specific <coughs> and pinning down the points that weren't dealt with, and hopefully it'll take less than six months to get an answer. Um, the correspondence then on page 80 there and following was uh, the paper from the uh, Minister there in regards to the October monitoring submission to um, DFP. Um, that went to DFP last week. Um, so, um, are there any points in there or any questions that members have in regards to that, or do you want to take that away and have a look at that? Yes, sir. Right? Yes. Yeah, take, take it away and have a look sure. at that. Sure. All I would highlight on that is this is the uh, line by line um, budget. So, members will notice it's slightly different from what we usually get in the monitoring round. Where we get the, the changes, the movements, and so on. This is this is a, a line by line. Effectively, every bit of spending in a department has a budget line, and that's just to highlight why this is different. So, if members want to take that back, we'll bring it back again. Okay. Um, page eighty-eight then is the um, letter from um, the minister in response to. Uh, Michelle McElveen's letter uh, about the Carl Frampton reception, <coughs> which is on the 14th, uh, next Tuesday. Um, go through that. Invites were emailed on Monday, uh, but uh, if members just note that. Then, next item is the uh, page 90, the 2014 National Youth Track Cycling. Championships, um, where Sport and I and Cycling <coughs> are currently working on a number of actions to promote cycling and cycling Ireland is in discussions with the Department of Transport, Tourism and Sport in Dublin about bringing a velodrome and badminton centre to Abbottstown. Um, would members agree that we keep a watching brief on developments around cycling infrastructure? Um, no, otherwise, okay. Yes. Um, 
There's a copy of the Minister's response to the OFM DFM inquiry into building a united community. That's at page 93 there. And um, that runs over a number of pages. Now, one of the things in their notice was um, on page 95, the Midnight Street Sucker. We would ask some questions about that the last time. We didn't get answers. We have, we're still waiting on that, Chris. Once I think it's still within our response deadline. OK. Um, we did ask... Chair, the specifics we were asking for was the what we got before from the department it talked almost exclusively about North Belfast and North Belfast play forum. So what we were asking was, is it just the North Belfast play forum that are running it? Was it widespread beyond there? Really just to get more details on how the actual programme itself runs. So that's still within um, deadline the, still within the deadline we set <coughs> sponsor terms. So we should expect that hopefully in the next week or so. Okay. Um, if members are content to note that, but we'll do it on the basis, same as the previous one, that if there's anything that we get a chance to read through it in more detail, if anything arises that you want to bring up, we'll put that on to uh, next week. Then, um, the next item there is page 101, uh, which is the annual report and uh, accounts. Um, the committee raised a number of issues regarding the controller and auditor general's qualifications. The first relates to the ownership of decal land and property and fishing rights. And work is continuing on settling issues surrounding ownership of the lagging navigation. The other qualification relates to the irregular spend incurred by the department. The business plans for Waterways Ireland and the North South Language Body were not approved by the Minister as she objected to the proposals for efficiency savings to exceed 3% previously agreed by the sponsoring departments. Um, if members would um, agree to hold that response until uh, a similar response is received from the Finance Minister and then we can um, look at them together. Um, members had asked to seek legal advice on the legality of the regular spend and the more information we have, hence the Minister's response, but also the DFP one. Um, we've been in a better position to get uh, better quality legal advice, so that DFP response is important. Um, and legal services will look at this once they get both of the letters together. Because there are issues, if you do, if you, I know the North-South year is a calendar year, not a financial year, as we understand it. Um, if you don't have um, approval from the ministers, um, you get into that area where I was always under the impression they could only spend a certain amount of the money up until the end of the year, and then you get this sudden splurge of money at the last week or two. Or are they actually underspending because they're not able to actually spend the money? You could actually be cutting off your nose to spite your face um, by refusing to uh, sign up, and it's, uh, because of uh, exchange rates and all other sorts of issues, that north-south issue is quite complicated. But uh, we'll, we'll get the response from DFP. Then it brings us back then to page 104, the point that um, William Humphrey raised there, and that's the response on um, LIFA. And as he says there, there are a number of points that he had raised at the time which there weren't answers. So we'll get the clerk there to compare the original letter, the response received, and the gaps that need to be um, addressed um, in that regard. So we can note that for today. <coughs> um, Correspondence from the department then on page 129. Uh, regarding issues raised at the recent Waterways Ireland briefing. Due to current funding limitations, all budgets are being challenged to ensure efficiencies are deliverable. The Minister won't accept efficiency savings beyond the minimum level agreed by both finance departments, so North and South bodies have been advised to manage risks within resources, with health and safety a statutory requirement and priority area. Waterways Ireland regularly reviews key risks and how to manage them. DECAL has discussed the issue of pension liabilities with the Department of Arts, Heritage and Gaeltag in Dublin and have advised Waterways Ireland that sponsor departments are not in a position to provide additional funding. Uh, the Minister goes on to state that as pensions are statutory obligation, Waterways Ireland must take steps to manage their budget um, appropriately. Um, so could we seek members' agreement to forward this correspondence to Waterways Ireland for comment? Okay. Yes. Could we actually 
ask a specific question on it on the yeah. projected pension the levels of uh, the impact yeah. to see and to see what impact that will have on their operating um, budget. Okay, yep. read that in the in the letter. Next item then is one three three, which uh, is the. Uh, proposed cuts to the current programme for the provision of arts within uh, prisons, as an arts foundation, um, and there's a response um, to that. Arts Council are unlikely to be in a position to fill the funding gap left by the prison service, ceasing to uh, um, fund uh, to offer funds. So, prison arts foundation have already met with decal officials, discussed the position. So, with that in mind, are members content to note? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, then, referring members to the response from DECAL uh, at page 136 regarding the curation of the Prison Museum, DECAL has not had any conversation with the Department of Justice or National Museum in Northern Ireland regarding the future of the collection, and officials are ready to work with DOJ once that department has reached a decision about the future curation and housing of the um, <coughs> collection. Where is that collection? Oh, it's housed at Malaya. Malaya, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah prison training. Prison officer training centre. Um, Are we in favour of that? Chair, I think the issue was that it, it hadn't been fully created, it wasn't on display, and um, the conditions were, were possibly going to deteriorate because it, it, it isn't being looked after. It, it's in that building where it's not being housed in a, I don't know what the proper museum phrase is, but it. it there, there's potential for, for degradation to it. So the, the idea was that it would be removed to somewhere else where it could be looked after and could be used either as a collection on its own or to augment another collection. Um, and it was a case of trying to clarify who was doing that, who had, who had responsibility for it. So essentially this response is indicating that the Minister hasn't discussed this with the Department for Justice, but is ready. Um, to offer um, officials to, to assist in any plan that the Justice Minister might have. Um, I'm not at all sure what the collection actually entails. It was the previous chair, I think, had seen it, um, and that was the basis on which we'd written the, the, the letter in the first place. I just think we need to be careful about whether we actually want to do... I mean, who knows what's in a prison museum stuff? Chair, would it be helpful to actually get a, a clarification of what the, the collection entails. Um, you see, I guess there was an inventory at one stage. I'm, Chair, I'm not sure that we had that through committee, but I, I try and get my hands on that, and it might actually be useful if I got the chance to go and look at it. And I, I might consider doing that as well so I can report back more fully, because a list of inventories never, mm -hmm. when you're coming to artefacts, it's never very useful, because yes. um, descriptions are not always what they could be. So I'll try and pin that down. We'll get some information on that to clarify the point, and then we'll be in a better position yep. uh, to comment. Um, the next item, then, is page 138, regarding the evaluation of uh, post-project evaluations of six um, projects that are outstanding, and we'll list of those. Draft PP for uh, Crescent Arts Centre is being finalised. DECAL plans to submit this in October, so within a matter of weeks. Um, the Elite Facilities Capital Programme 50 metre pool, that should be in November. Um, Lyric Theatre, December, January. <coughs> National Museums, Northern Ireland, purchase of off-site storage facilities. Um, that. So they've actually purchased off-site storage facilities? Chair, we had um, paperwork through in one of the previous monitoring rounds, and I, I can't pinpoint in my mind which one it was. It was definitely one of the ones last year, where money was being sought, uh, and I'm going to say it was a figure, I think, of half a million, <coughs> to secure the storage we <coughs> having previously was it had been rented and a lot of modifications that had to be made to the building in terms of the sort of climate control we'd seen down in Swords. And I think a decision was taken then that you really didn't want to be doing that indefinitely on someone else's building, so that they were then going forward to purchase. And um, I'm willing to be corrected in those figures, but those are my recollections, and that that's now what has happened. My recollection also was that there wasn't um, 
a huge amount of future proofing on that in terms of capacity, which was why we were looking at this option of do we need a bigger dedicated facility or is there scope to have the collections and the artifacts move somewhere else. So my recollection was that it was almost at capacity um, and therefore it's more just now of a repository rather than an ongoing um, site that has been future proofed. And that's, again, as I said, Chair, something we, we need to look into in relation to what we've seen at Swords as well. Yes, the, the, the issue there for the museum, I think, is um, looking forward. Mm. Museums tend to look back. Um, but looking forward um, to future opportunities. And if Heron Road, I'm sure, is a, a grand facility, but there are advantages in having things on site or near, so that when a person goes to a museum, um, to do some research or whatever. The other things, if they need to see them, are adjacent or very close, whereas that will obviously be considerable distance away from um, their other facilities. So it's something there would certainly, I think, want to um, look into uh, a bit more fully. Um, but anyway, the, the first point <coughs> of evaluation on that, which I've now lost the page. Here on page yeah, sorry, yes. Um, and then libraries, the IT programme, which we referenced to earlier, and then the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum, um, Cultural Manor. So those will be forthcoming um, in, in the dates indicated there. Members can enter the note. And then finally, um, response to the Minister at page 141 to this issue of year end surges. Uh, the Minister states that decal and the arm's length bodies operate a robust system of spending approval. Uh, members can tend to note again. Yeah. Members also take a look at page 144, which is sub regional stadium funding. The executive have endorsed the proposal to provide £36 million for sub regional stadium development for football in the next CSR period. Um, the department, however, cannot provide dates for clubs to start making bids for funds. The strategic outline case for football at a sub-regional level is currently under development, and this will then progress to an online business case. Chair, can I, I mean, I, um, I'm not involved in any football club other than supporting for good or ill, um, but I really wonder how those who are, like our good friend and colleague here, who are charged with running uh, Irish League clubs, which is very difficult at the best of times and currently in the current economic climate in particular. How on earth are they to plan for the future if we you know, get letters like that where, um, and I appreciate that there are, there are difficult times in terms of budgets and all of that, but you know, there's no certainty in this. There, there, there isn't even um, an indication of when. And, and I really do think that, you know, um, there's a growing uh, concern, speaking to people in various football clubs, there's a growing concern that their nervousness that this money may not come through at all. And, and I think you know, we, we need to provide that certainty and, uh, and reassurance to, to those boards and those uh, clubs that are, whose stadia are due to be upgraded under this um, injection of money um, to do that, because there has been little or no uh, investment in football stadia across Northern Ireland for some time, uh, other than you know one or two alternatives like Palomina and Glenavon and so on. There are other clubs like Coleraine um, who are hugely and desperately in need of this money, not least, for example, in terms of the, the Milk Cup, because the Milk Cups had to be moved. The final of the Milk Cups had to be moved from Coleraine to Palomina because the, the, the ground is no longer up to the, 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 the grade in the market to, to facilitate it. Uh, so. You know, we really need to, I think, try and get some um, assurances and, and, and certainty for those clubs. My understanding <coughs> that the, as I said there, the executive has endorsed the proposal. It is a, an executive commitment to provide that £36 million for sub regional stadium development for football. Um, the intention initially was that that would be in the next CSR period. Um, I suppose the issues now arising around the uncertainty about placement, because if there's some issue there, then money will not be spent mm. in the original timeline. 
and that will then have an impact because if there's money not spent on that, does that money become available for something else in the meantime? So I suppose it will become a lot clearer when we get the outcome of the, the court case regarding casement. Um, what? I accept the point you're making, Chair, but Ravenhill has already been completely redeveloped. Yes. Uh, yes. And a, a new stadium there, bar three mm -hmm. new stands, bar one. Uh, so, so that has been done, and that has progressed. Work has started at Windsor Park, uh, and I know they've had some delays in terms of um, uh, the asbestos and so on. There is the ongoing problem that you've outlined very clearly in relation to casement. But where there is no problem with the football grounds, I mean, some of these grounds, the, in terms of the facilities they have for spectators, are just... Primitive. Yes. And therefore, we, we really do need to get um, certainty around it, because, you know, I mean, Mr Hillage, Ms McElveen, your predecessor, and I went to the opening ceremony of the, the, the uh, Milk Cup, and I'd never been to it before, and there, you know, it's a great example, uh, and this committee has met the organisers, um, it's a great example of, of how sport reaches across the community, but also has a reach for Northern Ireland in a positive way across Europe, and in every continent in the world, is really, <coughs> and they're queuing up to get involved in it. The council that hosts it, can't host the final, and, and, and probably now the semi-finals as well, because the facilities aren't there. Mm -hmm. and I'm not saying because of the Milk Cup, you get it. You know, obviously Coleraine is a, is a very senior Irish league club as well. But but if you are strategically looking at putting in regional stadia that develop football, then one there is absolutely essential for that for that part of the world, for, for the northern part of North Antrim, if we can call it that, and East London. Down. If you just turn over the page there, there's also the <coughs> table papers chair. So table papers there, um, the table response from IFA on the sub-regional stadium funding. Um, so we'll have that letter from William Campbell um, in the CEO's office there. Thank you for your letter, um, which Patrick has forwarded. The association's um, facility strategy was completed in 2012, made it available. During 2013, the association undertook an executive sense of consultation process. Um, once the association repeats the colour it doesn't really tell you much either. Have you opened your wallet or anything? There's an alarm going off. <laughs> I checked out now. <laughs> Thank well, you. Don't chance on that really. No, <laughs> the alarm on my wallet is much louder than that. <laughs> um, so we're I would have hoped there might be a bit more clarification from the IFA. Yeah. Um, well, can I suggest, Chair, uh, uh, um, that perhaps we um, write to them as well, you know, asking, you know, because it is very, and, and there's, there is another issue, I'll keep, I'll keep quiet after this, there is another issue I wanted to raise in relation to the IFA, and I've raised this at the old party group, I've raised it directly with the IFA as well. Um, and Mr. Hillage, as chair of the old party group, knows that we've raised it. Um, today, the Northern Ireland under 19s are playing a, a, a qualifier in Dungannon. And I and a number of other people were going to go to that match until we find out that the kickoff was at 2 o'clock. A few weeks ago, the under 21s played a qualifier in Portadown, and the kickoff was at 2 o'clock. Or 4 o'clock, sorry. Now, it, it stands to sense the children are at school. And people who might potentially go to the matches are playing or are at work, and so therefore the you know effectively our team is going out in front of a very small crowd, two men the real we lad really, and you know how demoralising demoral is that for the players, and also in relation to the, the the visiting team, it must be a good boost for them to run out of the stadium empty, you know that this team's got no support. Now you know, we've good young players coming through. We've won the World Cup again this year. There was tremendous support for the Northern Ireland team who won the World Cup this year again. It's the same team that won the World Cup that's going to play this afternoon. And there were thousands at the final in the World Cup, and there'll be a handful there today. And I really do think you know this is something that needs to be taken on board and addressed by the, the IFA. Do, um, are you suggesting that we are small with them? Yes. Yeah. We propose then that we write to the IFA um, expressing concern about the kick-off times, which make it very difficult for people, uh, either at school or at work, to get there, and the detrimental effect that has on uh, the team. 
and the sport generally. <coughs> what is that? that shit, something? We're not entirely sure. It's outside the building. It's the server room, control room, indeed. Okay. All okay. oh, right. Okay. Um, Mr. Hamlet, one. Oh, yes, David. Yes, sir, it was really just a support what Mr. Homie says, and obviously I don't need to declare the relevant interest as being a director of one of the Irish League clubs, but it's also the confusion over the terminology being used as well, and we refer to 36 million here for the sub regional uh, stadium development for football. That, in most people's minds, related to the two or three particular ones there in Northern Ireland. There's also the problem that another section of government has designated some soccer and GA stadiums uh, and rugby as well as uh, made them into what termed as designated stadiums. And for public access and whatnot, have to comply with, with law and health and safety guidelines. And that lack of investment is starting to impinge heavily on that. Uh, Irish League attendances in particular are starting to increase. Uh, there, there are certain requirements being asked of clubs. Uh, as Mr Humphreys rightly says, uh, the, the help and assistance isn't there to keep up, basically. Um, it needs to move forward. I think it's, it's, I think it's to get the certainty or the clarity on, on what exactly some of the terminology mean, means as well. Yeah. Um, Get we something will, we will worked up on that. On yeah, we'll get something worked up on that and bring that back to, to the committee. Yep. What, we, what we need to be careful about is that we, you know, I'm a Linfield supporter and I know other Irish supporters, so, you know, at the end of the day, Windsor Park is going to be the national stadium for football, so it's it, it, it's sorted or will be. We ne do need to be careful, you know, that in terms of the investment, that there isn't a perception of government or a perception of the IFA that, well, Linfield and Northern Ireland is sorted. But other stadia then uh, around the country, you know, whether in Mid Ulster, whether in, uh, um, you know, County Londonderry, County Down, whatever, are not being forgotten about, or all, indeed other stadia in, in Belfast not being forgotten about that that they're, you know, Linfield, um, are not simply benefiting because that's now the IFA headquarters, which of course it's not the case. I mean, you know, they they. they that has always been the national stadium for football, but the, the truth of the matter is um, we've got to make sure the other clubs all feel that they will get their, their fair share. And th this was an entire <coughs> package, which was a balanced package across the three sports, and therefore I, would, I think the, the word that was used in earlier stage in the meeting of inescapable. It's inescapable because <coughs> of the whole commitment, and you can't cherry pick bits out of it and do a bit here and a bit there. Um, and all parties had signed up to that agreement. Mm -hmm. Chair, we will bring back co uh, draft correspondence next week because there are a lot of issues there, and, and I want to be sure that we've captured everything that members want to capture. So we'll draft something up and we bring it back to next week's meeting. Okay. Um, then the next one is page one four seven uh, regarding the infrastructure investment strategy portal. Which I'm sure, everyone has carefully studied, <laughs> <laughs> and um, members can tend to note that. Um, we've dealt already to some extent with the next one there, which was the Dale Farm uh, Milk Cup and the response there. So uh, we'll get the briefing at next week's meeting. That's noted. The response there, uh, 152 Carl Frampton success. And the first activity, there was an issue there regarding um, the, the department's funding. It was offered on the condition of boxing outreach facilities. Our activities um, being provided by the promoters. The first activity planned is a one-day boxing event in the Ulster Hall on the 25th of October, where young boxers from across Northern Ireland will have the opportunity to train with Barry McGuigan and Carl Frampton. And the second Happy Hearts <coughs> programme, visiting 12 schools in disadvantaged communities, two schools per county, and educating children on the importance of exercise and healthy eating for six weeks. Um, are members satisfied with that? Content to deal with that? Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, and then um, the individual responses from the three large sports IFA, rugby, and GA regarding post 2015 funding. We've got pages 158, 161, and 165, and all three have provided detailed information on the programmes they're currently running to meet the goals of tackling poverty and social exclusion whilst promoting quality through sport. And all three also state that without continued funding, the long-term sustainability of the programmes would be um, in jeopardy. Um, and that's a, that total programme is £4.5 million. So are members content to 
for these responses to the Minister for her comment. Yeah, agreed. Brings us then over the page here to correspondence. 168, page 168 there, um, we have, um, first of all, correspondence from DECAL regarding monitoring of savings delivery <coughs> plans in relation to the 11-15 budget. Minister states DECAL achieved the targets set at 13-14 and is on target for achieving the original targets for 14-15, so we can note that. Um, 169, September edition of EU Matters. Um, our members intend to note. I, I, I raised this yesterday, Chair, um, at the Deadly Committee. Um, I think it's a very useful publication, but I mean, there's always been this concern um, here that you know, is there a reach across all the government departments in terms of Europe? You know, we joined up in terms of lobbying Europe or you know, making sure we're everybody's you know saying the same thing in terms of Northern Ireland PLC and how you know the effect of you know, that the, the executive office in Brussels plays and all of that but also it, are we um, connecting with for example Belfast City Council I think now Londonderry as well have European units you know are, are, are the are, are the executive uh, departments here connecting with the council and vice versa and so on to get a joined up approach to lobbying for Europe to maximise. I mean, compared to the Irish Republic, we are, um, you know, the players or have been in terms of extracting funding from Europe, um, uh, and therefore we, I think, we um, need to have that joined up approach. And I, I'd be keen to know that that is happening. Chair, each department has a, a an EU champion that now work in a coordinated way. Um, to make sure that there is a better maximisation of, of what the departments are doing in Europe. This is, again, part of the Barroso task force. Within the executive's office, you also have the desk officers that look after specific areas relevant to clusters of departments, and they will work um, to ensure that, that Northern Ireland PLC, if I can put it that way, is not missing out on any of the opportunities. What um, this EU matters um, publication or, uh, or sort of news sheet is, is it's internal in the assembly. We now have a, a, an EU officer who is coordinating information. Now they are very much an internal um, function or they provide an internal function, um, but there is liaison across departments and also in terms of the council's European units and departments. There's a forum that is set up and the departments and councils that have European units all sit on that. So. There is a lot more coordination since the beginning of the Barroso task force process than there ever was before, and there's a much greater awareness um, and coordinated effort to tap into the funding that is out there. The activity is so much more than it ever was before. So it's an ongoing process, and I think there's a, a huge learning process there, and we've also learned um, from neighbouring jurisdictions as well as to what they do. So there's been a study done on this, and I think uh, the situation is much, much better than it ever was before. Thanks. Sorry, Oliver, yes. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, it was always known that the, the um, government in the South was in front of us as far as European front. And maybe it's time now we um, invited somebody here to let us know what they've done, or maybe we should be going down to, to, to the government Leinster House and talking to the relevant bodies there to see what they've been doing that's successful where we can maybe um, improve ourselves here, because uh, if they are that successful, which they are, we may be, uh, be able to do something here that would make us a little bit more successful. I think maybe we should go down to, we can down to them and talk to them to see what they can tell us. Could, could we do two things, maybe just initially? Picking up on um, the, the point of maybe champions, yeah. I'm not sure how it's coordinated or if it is coordinated across departments, but I do get a sense of that there's quite a difference mm. across departments in how they mm. tap into Europe. Could we get, is there some information regarding the level of input uh, or return from Europe um, across departments just to see who's doing better at it than others and how their lessons could be learned from other departments? And the second thing, Picking up on William Humphrey's point there about the European offices for the councils in Belfast, Londonderry, um, maybe some value in having a conversation mm -hmm. with them. 
and then we'll, we'll if we t do the local stuff first, and then so yeah. we know what's happening here, yeah, and then we'll look outside <coughs> Northern Ireland to, to see whether it's the Republic or elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, but I think we should, be, we should bear in mind that uh, that we do know that uh, the Southern government is, is successful, chair, and I, I do take on board what you're saying, the local thing, uh, and I don't agree with. Just you. to get a benchmark so you can compare elsewhere with. Well, in the meantime, maybe we should be co maybe we should correspond with them. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, yeah, we, 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 um, and, um, and, and tell yeah. them what we're what we're talking about here to see what they can tell us. We look at um, the most useful sources because the, in the Republic of Ireland they, they have regional EU units and so on who have representation within Brussels. I, I should also stress to the difference between Northern Ireland as a region and the, the Republic of Ireland as a sovereign state. Their access is different mm -hmm. um, and their, their freedom for movement is much different as well. Um, but we will look at just exactly how they structure their, their input and output and seek um, to correspond with the, the best and most Karen, if I could also draw member attention to page 171, the Northern Ireland Assembly Business Trust is going to Brussels on the 17th and 19th. And those members, I know Mr Hildage has been on one in the past, but um, there is quite a lot of cross-working between um, our office in Brussels and um, offices from the Republic of Ireland and other places. So uh, Mr McMahon may wish to... Uh, address himself to that particular opportunity as well. Well, if there's not much uh, going on, why are we saying here that uh, we uh, see the government in the South is so successful? Why are we not getting that feedback? Well, I think um, it's a maybe reflection of how long it takes to make things change. We've put a significant investment into the Northern Ireland office in Brussels. We do have case officers, we do have people work together, and the impression that I got when I was out there in the last couple of years is that they all work very closely together, including the Scottish and the Irish and the Northern Irish. It's actually one team where we are, you know, you'll find out that they do work collaboratively where that's possible. Though, as Mr Humphreys has just said, sometimes we are competing uh, for things, so you do have to keep your powder dry in that regard. But I'm just drawing attention to it that that's where it really all works. Significant investment in that. And, uh, uh, you know, you should consider saying to the party that you should go on it. It's a very good, I, it's I a very good trip. I don't have to consider I'm talking to the committee here. I'm what what I'm asking, what I'm, oh. there's no sense being flippant about it. I'm just asking yeah, the committee yeah. if we should open up a, a line of correspondence. And on that score, um, also from uh, previous experience uh, on, in Belfast City Council with the European unit there, and William Humphrey would have had a similar experience. Um, there's a wealth of knowledge there because th they go to conferences and so on, events, and they're engaging with um, on cross border projects with people in the Republic. So they've got a very good sense there of, um, of what uh, is being done better, maybe, or differently in the Republic or elsewhere. Um, and what opportunities there are that yeah. we might avail of. Because I think, if I'm right, Laura Leonard, who's the, the, the manager of the European Unit, actually was seconded for a few days to yes. go and work in London Day to help them establish uh, a, a unit. And she was she was in front of, um, I think it was OFMD FM a few years ago. I'm not sure, Peter, you were the clerk at that time or not. Yes, but she was she was in, in front of the OFMD FM committee, as, you know, in, in talking about along with all the key figures from here and the Belfast European Union. Um, Office. Yeah. I've been working in that field of Europe yeah. for quite a number of years now. There is a wealth of, of a body of knowledge there. But we'll, we'll follow up on those indeed. Thank, Thank you. Care. Thank you. Um, moving on down to 174 then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Investing activity report for September is at page 174. We're prepared to note that. Libraries NI quarterly screening report, page 178. And um, again, to note that, which brings us down to um, the um, final items here, chairperson business. There's invitation on page 181 from Colleges NI regarding the further education showcase on the 14th of October. Um, invitation at page 183 to the card front reception on the 14th of October as well. Um, Creative Belfast, uh, invitation to attend Output, the Northern Ireland Music Industry Conference, scheduled for Thursday the 16th at 1.15 at the MAC, which is 
Thursday and also after this committee. Um, so if anybody wants to attend, could they let the, the committee office team know? And then page 185, Lindholm Library, offering to host a committee meeting in the library at some stage uh, in the future. And um, if you're agreeable, we'll write back to them, thanking them for the offer and agreeing to hold a meeting there in the new year. Okay. Uh, forward work programme is at page 187, and if the clerk would speak to that. Chair, um, this is now relatively complete uh, until the final meeting of, the set of this term uh, on the 11th of December. Uh, we've just got a couple of um, meetings still to pin down and clarify. Um, but the, the ones I would draw members' attention to are the ones where we still have remaining briefings for the inquiry. Members are aware that we were going to try and, and have a final briefing from the uh, Arts Council. We, we've just due to scheduling, we, we have additional briefing after that from our audiences and I. But we will have completion um, on the inquiry um, evidence gathering process by the end of November. The other ones to highlight are the visit to the corn store in Draperstown on the 6th of December and the meeting at the department on the 11th of December where they're, they're hosting our meeting at Oswald Change. Um, there's also the Spectrum Centre on the 27th of November. November. Okay, there's a corn store. Corn store is the 6th of December. Saturday. No, no, that's a Thursday. These are these are all normal committee days. Fourth of December. Oh, then. Sorry, fourth of December. Sorry, sorry, I was thinking second. Of sorry, fourth of December. You're right. You're right. I'd made that mistake. The email him actually as well. Um, so those are all on the program, and as I say, almost everything now is confirmed. We've just a couple that are TVCs. Okay. Thank you. The corn store. Where's that in? It's Draperstown. It's a. It's a, an educational and sort of. Learning, it's, it's it's quite an interesting project. Can, can I just ask you the briefings, Ofcom and uh, uh, community broadcasting? Is that community TV? Yeah, that's the new uh, it's TV and radio. Um, Ofcom are going to talk to us on both of those. Do, do we, given that some of those are already out in the rest of the United Kingdom, uh, would it be any chance we could get a, a briefing from maybe the research people just as what's out there? In, in advance of it, just to know what other people are doing. Okay. Chair, in terms of the, the NVTV briefings, well, there are six city broadcasters. Um, other ones that, that come to mind are there's one in Bristol as well um, that, that has had a fairly big and splashy launch. So we we'll get um, Dr. Hull to do some research on that. Just sort of in Glasgow as well, I think. Yes. Something. So it just if there's people already. Anyway. Absolutely, no, we, we'll get that sorted out for that briefing. Then, session there. Yeah, we yeah, into a just a closed session there. If the clerk could, or so the usher could uh, deal with that. Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.